Welcome, brethren. Sorry for being a few minutes late. We're just trying to make everything work perfectly. Now, don't forget, we're doing this on StreamYard, which means when I say something and when you hear me say something, there's about a 15-second, close to 20-second delay. So bear with us. Be patient. Our brother, Perry Robinson, is going to have to print out his notes because he wants to share the screen where you can see the citations from the church fathers. But at the same time, he has to have the notes to read from because when he shares the screen for you to see, he can't see it. So until he prints it out, here's what I need you guys to do. I need you guys to do me a favor. Number one, obviously pray that the Holy Spirit fills us. The Holy Spirit anoints our brother Perry Robinson and guides him to speak truth clearly and accurately for the glory and majesty of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray because everything good is the work of the grace of the Holy Spirit in us. And secondly, share the links, invite people because this is going to be a spiritual meat fest. So let me bring up the brother. Welcome, brother Perry Robinson. Good to have you here, brother. You too. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I I appreciate it for the uh, opportunity. This was uh, a lot of fun putting this together. So I hope Amen. people find it profitable. And uh, I'm looking forward to interacting with people uh, afterwards. So yep. uh, you come very highly recommended by the Orthodox. And for those who may not know who you are, what your background is, could you give us a short introduction? Who you are? What's your background? How long have you been in an Orthodox? And why are you qualified to talk about this subject? Yeah, um, so I've been doing apologetics for over 30 years. Um, my educational background is in philosophy. I got my undergraduate and graduate degrees in philosophy. Um, I taught philosophy as um, when I was a graduate student and also adjunct faculty for uh, about eight years. Um, I've been Orthodox for about 21 years now. So before that, I uh, was baptized from a Catholic, raised the Episcopal Church, went to non-denominational church. Then I was reformed for a number of years, went back to an Anglican tradition, and then eventually my wife and I became Orthodox in 2000. So um, I'm more or less active in the apologetic community. I've worked with or for different counter cult or apologetic organizations. I worked in the early 90s. I worked for the, at the Christian Research Institute between 1990 and 1992. Uh, spent some time hanging out with Mike Horton and Kim Riddlebogger and that whole crowd and the reform crowd. So I'm familiar with, with that community as well. Um, so that's kind of my background. Uh, I'm married, have a bunch of kids, mm, happy do. as a clam. So as far as that goes, so I'm glory to the tribe God. It. So just so people can understand you, have had experience as a reformed Christian, meaning you at one time embraced the same soteriology that Brother Anthony Rogers continues to embrace. So <clears throat> you know that tradition, and now you've been a devout Orthodox by the grace of the Holy Spirit for 21 years. So did I hear you right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so yeah, I, I, I still, and I still read reformed theology. I, I try to read as widely as I can. I think it's important to try and read the best that other positions have to offer so that you can understand them clearly. Um, so that's part of my goal tonight is to represent, try to clarify what the issues are, because there's a lot of there's a lot of unclarity and confusion as to what what certain terms mean or what they could mean. Or so, yeah, I speak in short, I speak fluent Calvinist. So yeah, Calvinist God. is pretty, it's pretty good. Glory to the trying God. And people are going to be blessed because you have as much time as you want. Don't feel any pressure because we want to know the issues and understand the issues for the glory of Jesus because we love and worship the God who is the truth. And if we love him, we need to be truthful. With that said, I know Anthony Rogers and I know he loves the Lord Jesus and he serves the Lord Jesus with integrity. And I know because he loves the Lord and loves his truth, and he's not about ego and winning arguments, that once he's shown the clear evidence, and it's overwhelming, that the church fathers did not teach sola fide as defined and understood by the reformers, it's not an ego fest for him. I know because of his love for Jesus, he'll be humble enough to accept correction and not make this 
<clears throat> into an eagle fest and a battle of wits. Because ironically, when I did see him, I saw him face to face, and I mentioned you, he did say that you used to have some run-ins with the late <clears throat> Steve Hayes of Tribe Law. And supposedly, because I know Steve Hayes, he has to get the last word. So it doesn't mean he wins. It's just he won't stop. And some people don't have the time to invest. But I was told you got schooled by Steve Hayes. Any yeah. Schoolers? <laughs> uh, Steve Hayes and I had been arguing for about 20 years or so, um, off and on, on various things. So there were times when Steve would respond. And as you're right, Steve, late Steve Hayes was, was a machine. He could, he could crank it out and he could crank it out pretty fast. Um, I didn't always have the opportunity to respond or I just judged that his arguments weren't really, there were, really wasn't anything there left to shoot at. So, um, I respected Steve. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to speak ill of the dead. Yes. Um, I, I think Steve and I came to a point after 20 years of kind of becoming frenemies mm -hmm. where we had a kind of mutual respect. He, we both thought each other was, were heretical, but we both respected, um, our personal integrity, I think. So, um, the last few years, there were certain things we collaborated on. Um, and I'm, and I'm thankful for Steve for, um, stepping up to the plate for that. So for whatever it's worth to people who are watching from tribe blog, uh, I appreciate that. Glory to God. Now, brother, once you get your material ready, I'll present it and I'll be in the background. I mean, I'll, I'll be hearing you, but people won't see me because you got the floor. Take as much time as you want. No rush because I want the people to see the issues and see that if you're going to interpret the fathers contextually, historically, not anachronistically, they don't teach the Protestant understanding of sola fide. So if you want to bring up your screen so I can share it, we'll begin in prayer, and then you let me know when you're done. I'll be listening in the background intently because I'm a student. I need to learn about the fathers, and that's why I bring a variety of voices that have spent time in the fathers. So we're going to put up the screen. Now, before I hand it off to you, let me pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, the eternal heart of the Father, the eternal companion and love of the Spirit, bless your servant, Perry Robinson. Empower and anoint him by your Holy Spirit to glorify your name, Lord Jesus, and speak the truth clearly and accurately, and represent the writings of your holy servants, these holy martyrs, the theologians and the apologists that the Spirit raised up, to defend the church against heresies, to preserve the scriptures, to explain the scriptures correctly, and in honor of the memory of these holy men, holy servants who are now glorified in your presence, use Perry to interpret their statements correctly for your glory. And Lord Jesus, by your spirit, illuminate hearts and minds to know what the truth is. It's not about winning arguments. It's about loving you and knowing your word and knowing your truth and living it out with the passion and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I am honored, Lord, that you'd have this man come and bless us with the wisdom you've given him. Have your way with him by your spirit. It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother, I'm going to recede in the background. And if okay. you need me, just let me know. I'll be listening. Okay. I'm going to begin the slideshow. And so... I want to say a few things first. Um, I'd like to dedicate this to the memory of a friend of mine who was a mentor, uh, Bill Zuck. Uh, Bill was extremely well read and it was Bill who got me starting to understand and, and come out of the Reformed tradition. So Bill died a number of years ago, um, but Bill was incredibly well read. We used to call him infallible. Uh, because he had read just about everything. And I'd also like to mention um, Russ Mannion. Uh, he's been a personal mentor of mine since I've been 13, 14 years old. And uh, Russ Mannion is probably the greatest Christian apologist that you've never heard of. So for Russ, uh, he's still with us. Uh, thank you very much for all those years. So the you'll notice the title of the presentation is Shapes in the Clouds. And this captures fundamentally my thesis with respect to Mr. Rogers. Um, I believe that looking over the two videos that he did and some other material that he presented, uh, first on Sola Fide and the Church Fathers, and then 
on uh, Marius Victorinus, claiming that Marius Victorinus expresses the Protestant doctrine of sola fide, that what's actually happening is the basically word concept fallacy and uh, fallacy of anachronism. He's reading back into terms in the past, uh, positions that just aren't being expressed, or if they are being expressed, there's nothing to indicate in the text that they are. So we don't have an evidentiary basis to say that they're actually expressing sola fide. So Mr. Rogers had said in the in the past that other people were special pleading, that uh, they really liked his Trinitarian stuff, and when he'd argue against Jehovah's Witnesses and other people like this, um, and then when he quoted the fathers, he was reliable then. But now that he, you know, doesn't, you know, he's attacking uh, a traditional Christian point of view that um, now people just say, oh, you're just quote mining. And so this is special pleading. This is a fallacy, uh, a double standard, so to speak. Well, I've never watched any of other any other videos from Mr. Rogers other than the ones I pretty much just mentioned. So my analysis isn't based on special pleading. If he was or wasn't misquoting or quote mining the fathers there in those path in those other videos, I have no idea. So I'm restricting myself to the pretty much the two videos that he presented. Um, and so I will assess um, whether he's quote unquote quote mining there. And quote mining I take to be just throwing out text that with no analysis or supporting argument that actually demonstrates what the person claiming the text says actually expresses. So that's kind of a rough and ready off the top of my head gloss of what I think um, uh, quote mining is. So what I really would like, um, if Mr. Rogers, if you're if you're watching this evening or you watch later, what I would really would like is not to have so much an adversarial conversation with you or other people. What I'm really trying to do is clarify what the issues are. So I'm trying to get the audience and you, Mr. Rogers, to kind of have an insight. And the insight I want you to have is I want you to understand why, at the very least, someone like myself isn't persuaded by the case that you presented. So um, here we go. All right, so tonight I'll be, I'll be arguing two propositions or two theses. There's a weak thesis and a strong thesis. Um, the the uh, weak thesis is that Rogers provided insufficient evidence to support his conclusion that at least some of the church fathers expressed the Protestant doctrine of sola fide. The strong thesis is there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the majority of father, church fathers that Rogers cites taught a different view of justification other than sola fide. Um, so I'll be arguing both of these theses and I'll be restricting myself to fathers that he cites uh, and not fathers that he doesn't. So it may be the case that um, he has other church fathers that aren't in those videos that he could cite, that he believes um, do in fact, and he could demonstrate, do in fact teach the Protestant doctrine of, of sola fide. I don't have those. I only have the ones that he he put out on the videos. So that's why I'm restricting myself to, to these um, theses. So I wanna conduct a little bit a little thought experiment here. And what I want people in um, the chat to, to do is I want them to ask themselves this question. And right now I can't see the chat. So as just as a housekeeping thing, and I'm sure um, Sam knows this, just try and hold all of your questions to the end. Um, maybe write them down. You might need a, a screen capture in a few minutes. So that might be something handy to bring up because I'm going to give you something to do while we're going through all of this material. And trust me, there's a ton of material. So do any of the following texts, the text I'm going to show you, express the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone? That's the question I want in your head when you look at these texts and I go through them. So let's start going through them. And I'm not going to provide any attribution to the text. So I'm not going to tell you who they're from. And no cheating. You can't cheat because it'll just spoil the whole point of what uh, I'm trying to do here. So Honest Abe and all of that. So here we go. So for the um, first text, for the righteousness of God is revealed in it, either because it was just that the rest of the believers should be saved in the same way that Abraham was, who when, be, who when he believed was saved from among the Gentiles initially by faith alone. There's that phrase. Or because the testament which God, who is truthful, promised in the law had to be revealed by faith, in faith, 
or because the Jew is justified by faith and the Gentile in faith, he wrote by an in, this is the translator's brackets. Every time you see those brackets, those are added by the um, editor or translator of the text and not myself, they're original to the printed text. He wrote to avoid the fault of tautology as it is written, the just shall live by faith, not by works of the law. So there you see the, um, you see the phrase uh, faith alone right here. And so does that, ask yourself, does that express faith alone? The author is giving different interpretations and kind of letting you pick, but does that teach, does that express the doctrine of faith alone? So let's think about that. We've got a bunch more to go through right here. So, but to one who does not work, but who believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So this is obviously on uh, commenting on Paul's epistle to the Romans um, in uh, Romans 4. It says, when, the, when an ungodly person converts, God justifies him by faith alone, not for the good works he did not have. So does that teach faith alone? Does that express or exhibit that concept? It's got the words. I think, uh, I think Sam, we, we might have, I might have made a mistake. I might have found texts that actually teach more patristic texts that teach faith alone. We'll, we'll have to see. So that all who believe among the Gentiles are children of Abraham, when faith alone is credited to them as righteousness, and they too become circumcised, but in heart. Next, because they did not know that God justifies by faith alone, and because they thought that they were righteous, by works of the law, they did not keep, speaking of, of the, uh, the Jews at the time of Christ. They refused to submit themselves to the forgiveness of sins to prevent the appearance of their having been sinners, as it is written. But the Pharisees, rejecting the purpose of God for themselves, refused to be baptized with John's baptism. Ooh, they refused the purpose of God. That, that guess must not be irresistible purpose. Anyway, for the end of the law is Christ, for the righteousness, righteousness of all who believe on the day one believes in Christ, it is if, it is if one has fulfilled the whole law. That, that might be forensic uh, imputation there. For Moses wrote of the righteousness which is by the law. Moses himself distinguished between two kinds of righteousness, namely the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of deeds, because the one justifies the suppliant by works, but the other by belief alone. So does that, does that express sola fide? Well, got, got a couple more here. All of Israel thus was being saved in the same way as the full number of Gentiles by faith alone. So that because they had been equals in transgression, they were equals in Christ. Next up, we just have one or two more of these. Then he, St. Paul, shows how the eternal award is related to faith, saying, but to those who, who does not work, uh, outward works, for example, because he does not have time to work, as in the case of one who dies immediately after baptism, but who believes in him who justifies the ungodly, namely in God, of whom he says below, it is God who justifies. His faith is reckoned, that is, faith alone, without outward works, as righteousness, so that in virtue of it he is called just. Sounds like the Protestant doctrine, maybe, and receives the reward of justice, just as if he had done the works of justice. As he says below, Romans 10.10, 10, man believes with his heart, so is justified. According to the purpose of grace of God, and accordingly, as God proposes to save men gratuitously, who are called according to his purpose, he accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. I believe this is the last one. He cleansed their hearts by faith, and this apart from works of law, not only without ceremonial works. Now look at this. So it's not just ceremonial works, not just the ritual works of law, which did not confer grace, but only signified it, but also without works of moral precepts. And I decidedly remember Mr. Rogers making a big point of this. It's going to be interesting to see who, who said that. Anyway, as stated in Titus 3, 5, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness. So you need to ask yourself, do, do any of these or all of these texts express salvation by faith alone, the Protestant doctrine? Well, I don't think that uh, they do, right? So the reason is all but the last two uh, quotes are from this source. That is Pelagius's commentary 
on the book of Romans because Pelagius wrote a number of commentaries. He wrote, matter of fact, he wrote commentaries on the entire Pauline corpus uh, with the exception of Hebrews, depending on whether you believe Paul wrote Hebrews or not. Um, but yeah, he wrote quite a bit on Paul. So all those quotes are from Pelagius. The last two, surprisingly, are from Thomas Aquinas. Now, I'm not Catholic, but I thought it would be good just to throw in um, some Aquinas. And that's because part of what I'm trying to do here is create as broad a um, presentation. So I'm going to try and present things in such a way for the majority of the material that a Catholic could agree to it, an Orthodox Coptic could agree to it, somebody from uh, like Sam from the Assyrian Church could agree to it. Um, that won't always be the case. There will be some points where we disagree, but I wanted to, uh, that's the general kind of framework. So that's why I threw in uh, Aquinas there. So notice that Aquinas also uses the uh, expression by faith alone. And Aquinas, uh, like Augustine and a number of other people, includes works of the moral precepts in being excluded from as a basis for uh, justification, at least in some way. We'll see a little bit more about that later. So what was the point of the exercise? The point of the exercise was to see that um, it's possible to uh, use the same words and not express the same concept. Uh, and in fact, you can use many different words to express uh, the same concept, and you can use identical terms and not have that meaning in mind at all. You saw from Pelagius right there. Now, why is Pelagius important for people who may not know? Pelagius was the paradigm case in the history of the church who taught justification by works righteousness. So I believe all of my Reformed friends out there, my Lutheran friends and others, would agree that whatever Pelagius means when he talks about justification by faith alone, and those are certainly not uh, the only uh, places where he talks like this, I think they'll agree with me that whatever he means by it, he doesn't mean the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. Now, what's important about this is Pelagius is writing not too far off from many of the people that we will be looking at, many of the patristic figures. And so it's important to realize that it's also a possibility that when they're using the term faith alone, they don't mean the Protestant doctrine. After all, Protestantism is historically uh, a thousand years later. And so some of these people are written, you know, writing in a different language, they're in a different culture, or even if they are writing in Latin or Greek, um, that language changes over time as well. And the reformers were, you know, uh, just men. I mean, I don't always paraphrase James White, but in this point, I think, I think it's appropriate that, you know, I can let the reformers be what they were. They're fallible men. So their command of Greek and Hebrew and other languages isn't infallible. There are places where they made mistakes. So we need to keep all of that in mind. Um, and here I want to share to make the point, this quote from uh, J. Warren Smith in this article, Justification of Merit Before the Pelagian Controversy over Ambrose. This, in fact, is actually an excellent article. If you guys want to pick this up, he writes, on the one hand, as students of Christian history, we discipline ourselves to read the, these ancient documents within their own frame of reference and not superimpose later categories and concepts into text. That would be the fallacy of anachronism. It is necessary to keep those texts at arm's length, recognizing that they are of another time. Avoiding anachronistic readings of the fathers allows their ancient voices to retain their own integrity and not to be refashioned into our image. There's a nice spelling quote or a misspelling on my part. There's probably going to be a bunch of those coming through. So <clears throat> in any case, I think that this illustrates and it's kind of a portend of what we're going to see as we go through the rest of the material. So um, the use of the term faith alone is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition to express the Protestant doctrine of sola fide. Now, because sola fide is wrapped up with certain concerns uh, in the history of theology, particularly with Pelagianism, we need to take a little bit of time to get clear on the difference between Pelagianism semi-Pelagianism, uh, anti-Pelagianism in general, and sola fide in particular. So to define Pelagianism, um, 
for Pelagius, sometimes people just roughly characterize Pelagianism as works righteousness. That's actually something that's entailed by Pelagius, his error. His main error is that he identifies nature as great with grace. And what this means is that for Pelagius, human nature is somewhat impenetrable to grace. Grace is entirely external to it. And so the same thing with sin. When Adam falls for Pelagius, uh, this does not affect his nature, right? So his nature is kind of impenetrable to sin in that way. And so this is the fundamental error. So because Pelagius thinks of it in this way, then um, he thinks that all that humans need is a good example to follow because they have all the natural power. Their natural power, even after the fall, is sufficient to please God, to merit God, right? And so ironically, you're thinking my Calvinist friends are like, Perry has just gone and lost it because he's saying that Pelagius is monergistic. Well, actually, he is monergistic because he thinks there's only one will working in justification, right? And he thinks there's only one work, will working throughout the whole Ordo Salutis. It's not God's will, so it's not monergism with respect to God. It is monergism with respect to the individual believer. Likewise, because Pelagius thinks that nature is grace, that nature is kind of self-enclosed, justice for him is forensic. It is external, right? So um, you might even say it's imputed, uh, depending on the academic you're reading about Pelagius. And consequently, grace is exemplary. So when Pelagius talks about God giving us grace, he doesn't mean it in the sense of something going on inside of us. He means of us means it in the sense of God giving, for example, the law is a good example for us to follow. That was gratuitous. God's like, here, here's the rule book. This one's free. Best of luck. Um, also for Pelagius, as I said before, sin is forensic. It's external. It's a mere bad example. So Adam, when he reads Paul in Romans 5 and other places, he's understanding Adam to have set a bad example, which we just followed. And then out of habit, we did things habitually sinful. We just have this bad habit that we need to rid ourselves of. So next up, we need to distinguish Pelagianism for semi-Pelagianism. So semi-Pelagianism does distinguish between nature and grace, but what it essentially is characterized by is nature is sufficient for the first moment of salvation apart from divine grace and aid. And this is actually very historically important um, because during the uh, fifth, sixth century, semi-Pelagianism was condemned at the Synod of Orange, I believe it's in 529. And the problem became is eventually the acts of Orange were lost in the West. And this allowed for space under um, late medieval Catholic scholasticism with John Duns Scotus, and then eventually in Gabriel Beale and others, uh, advocates of what were called the Via Moderna or the, the, the modern way of arguing, well, it's possible if somebody's contrite enough, if they work up enough fear that they can, out of the fear of God, have contrition and that will prepare them for faith or may even move them to the first first act of salvation being faith. And this was actually important because this is exactly what Luther struggled with. It wasn't the, necessarily the only Catholic view, but the loss of the Acts of Orange allowed for that view in certain people, most notoriously in Gabriel Beale, um, to arise. And it wasn't prominent in places like Italy or Spain, but it was very prominent that teaching in Germany in the particular order that Luther was a member of. So semi-Pelagianism um, is important to understand here. Basically, it's the idea that you can't have your own natural power move yourself to faith or prepare yourself for faith apart from grace. So now we need to define some characteristics of anti-Pelagianism. So this, who's the paradigm case of being an anti-Pelagian? Well, it's Augustine, St. Augustine of, of Hippo. So Augustine distinguishes between nature and grace. He also distinguishes between what we would call con, uh, condign and congruous grace. That is grace given without any human uh, participation or activity, and then grace that's given that we cooperate in. So this would be the distinction between 
excuse me, between operative grace and cooperative grace. And you can see this in Augustine's letter, uh, work on the letter in the spirit uh, and a number of other works uh, that he wrote. So uh, next it's participationist. What does this mean? It doesn't mean everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> what it means is that because Augustine distinguishes between nature and grace, he believes that Adam was created grace was added to him at the moment of creation to kind of stabilize his nature and and help perfect him and so for augustine when adam falls he falls from a state of grace to nature now it's nature in a weakened state but the nature in and of itself is still fundamentally good so what is the participationist idea the participationist idea is that in salvation augustine believes that our acts participate in god's acts that they partake, that there's an overlap, that these two acts um, kind of co-inhere with each other. So you could say that for Augustine, one and the same act can be both fully mine and also fully God's at the same time. Uh, no zero sums. What does this mean? This means basically that for Augustine, um, things are not a zero sum game with it when it comes to activity, that is human and divine activity. It's not the case that if I'm working, God can't be working. And if God is working, I can't be working. Now, that may be true in some cases for Augustine, but in justification, Augustine is very synergistic in the respect that he believes that we participate in God's acts. So that's what it means by zero sum. It's not a zero sum game. It's not like I'm pulling two guys are pulling a load. And if one guy sits down, the other guy has to make up the difference. That's not how Augustine thinks of it, right? It's cooperative. Uh, Augustine also thinks of, or anti-Pelagianism is characterized by faith as a condition or ground of justification. And this is a very realist view of justification. By realist, I mean the idea that things are called or classified on the basis of their nature. So the idea would be for Augustine, Abraham has faith. Faith is a supernatural virtue that pleases God. And that's the basis on which God declares Abraham just. So it's still legal. It's still a legal declaration, but it's based on something that's true of Abraham. So then next we have faith as a valuable, uh, faith is valuable or a pleasing virtue. So anti-Pelagians generally see, like Ambrose and Augustine and others, and Eastern Fathers as well, see faith as being intrinsically valuable as opposed to extrinsically valuable. The difference is, Intrinsically, it's valuable in and of itself, as opposed to it's valuable for what you can use it for. Right? That will be an important distinction in just a few moments. Um, also, anti-Pelagianism is characterized by a coalescing or a confluence of divine and human activities. Again, that gets us back to the participationist. They also view um, that there's a qualitative change in us with respect to justification. So it's not quantitative. So for Augustine and Ambrose and other people, it's not how much righteousness you have in terms of um, God producing good works in you that please him because they have that supernatural characteristic. It's that they're qualitatively different. It's not that they're quantitatively different. <clears throat> this is why they talk about increasing in justice. Uh, next, anti-Pelagianism is characterized by an, uh, by uh, the notion of an adherence or an adhering cause so that faith, again, is that real state of the soul um, that is the cause of justification, right? It's the basis for justification. Also, anti-Pelagians will include when they uh, exclude works of the law of uh, person's own natural ability. They'll exclude or they'll include that works of the law, therefore, means also the moral precepts of the law, not just the ceremonial aspects. Now, also the last thing is an important point. They do talk about meriting God's favor, but there's no strict merit. That is, it's not a one-for-one -one relation. It's not like in, in the gospels where Jesus says, you know, when I was thirsty, you gave me a cup of water. Okay, a cup of water is now proportionate to eternal life. That, that would be, a cup of water would be, okay, here's a dollar or whatever the market value of a dollar is, right? Um, that would be strict merit. But when anti-Pelagians talk about merit or merit in God's favor, 
They mean it in the sense of pleasing God, right? As Paul says in, I think, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, he talks about our good works that please God, which for some same reason when Calvin comments on it, he just kind of ignores that whole language of pleasing, good works pleasing God. In any case, there's no strict merit. Um, there is merit, but it's not strict merit. And that will be very important because sometimes like people like Mr. Rogers come to these texts where they talk about merit, um, or they see merit in theological sources, they think, well, it's merit, so it's earning, and it's, so it's a one-for-one -one relationship. So Augustine, for example, talks about uh, God crowns our merits with his grace, right, with his gifts and things like this. So it's what they're trying to say is the act is both ours and it's both God's, right? So we can't claim any ultimate credit for it, but it is pleasing to God. So next up, we need to define sola fide. And this is difficult because there's a lot of confusion, especially in the evangelical world. Um, a lot of people think that justification by faith alone is the idea that I have faith and then God does the rest. Um, that's not justification by faith alone. Um, generally in the reformed churches uh, and Lutheran churches, they look down on evangelical Arminians as compromising the gospel because they view faith as a human work that's done in, in some way that you could, on reformed principles, claim credit for, um, which was, in fact, part of the entire reason why Luther wrote Bondage of the Will, uh, was to pretty much kill off that kind of idea or any kind of semi-Pelagianism. Uh, rather, sola fide is a much more narrow thesis, and this is going to be important to get clear about. So sola fide depends on the idea of created righteousness. So when Christ is on earth in Reformation theology and he's obeying the law and he's not failing to observe the law in any way, so he's not committing any sins of omission or sins of commission, he's um, kind of meriting righteousness. But this is not the righteousness, uh, as Mr. Rogers correctly pointed out in his videos, it's not the righteousness whereby God is righteous in and of himself. This is a created righteousness. It's a created effect. OK, and that will be important to, to keep in mind later on. Now, when I said you might want to do a screen capture, this is what you're going to want to capture here because you're going to use this later. So take a snapshot, put it off to the side. Um, if it covers up my beautiful face, I really don't care. So just go ahead and do that. Um, but you're going to need to keep these categories in mind when we're looking at a number of patristic texts. So just take a moment and do that while I go through the rest of the um, items here. So um, on sola fide, faith is not intrinsically uh, valuable. It's actually empty and worthless before God with respect to justification. It has no inherent value. It's not a basis or a condition for, for justification at all. Um, so sometimes it's characterized by the, the empty hand, right? There, that it has nothing. To, to offer, right? Uh, next is faith is viewed as an instrumental extrinsic cause, and therefore it's a conduit of justification, or it's a conduit for created righteousness or a created merit. So the idea here would be um, like my kidney is intrinsic to me, right? Or it's at least inherent in me. Uh, whereas a hammer that I use to make something, that's instrumental. That doesn't characterize me in and of in and of myself. So um, faith is something that's valuable, not in and of itself on sola fide, but what you can use it to get or what it serves as kind of the highway or conduit for the transfer of that created righteousness, that created merit, because the reform will tell you they believe justification is by merit. It's just not your merits. Right. It's Christ's merits. And then that brings us to uh, that sola fide views uh, justification as forensic or taxonomic reclassification. What does that mean? And this is important because a lot of times people use the term forensic and they're really confusing it with legal. And you can be legal or use legal or judicial language and not have this very narrow sense of forensic. So, for example, a non-forensic view of law or justice would be, and this is found in antiquity, um, 
prior to the Reformation in certain cultures, where uh, you go to court, you're declared guilty, and the belief is that that declaration actually makes you guilty. Or if you are declared righteous, that declaration actually makes you righteous. That would not be forensic. Why? Because it's classifying you, right, based on some internal state. Now, what does forensic mean? It means just the opposite, that you are not classified based on anything of your nature. It's entirely a matter of will. So the idea is God wills to classify you one way, and then that changes, and he wills to classify you another, regardless of your actual nature. So in this way, it's very nominalist. Nominalism is the thesis about universals or how things are classified, and that those classifications or taxonomies, those categories, are not real. They're just kind of created fictions or constructs. Next, defining um, sola fide, uh, we have a transfer of created merit. And then also that we have to keep a strict separation of activities between God and man. There can be no participation of human activity in justification. Um, and there, consequently, the matter is, is a zero-sum game. If I'm working, then God can't be working and vice versa in justification. Also, justification on sola fide is thought to be quantitative, as opposed to, we saw earlier, uh, qualitative. That is, justification has to be complete in order for it to count as actually being justified. So it has to be total. This is one reason why it has to be forensic, because a legal declaration isn't like partially just. You either are just or you're not. It's like being pregnant. There's, there's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. You either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. So it also excludes um, any kind of merit or merit uh, simplicator, right, in and of itself. There's no kind of merit allowed whatsoever on the part of the recipient of justification with respect to justification. So um, next up, let's see here. I had to print this out because I couldn't get this to share the right way. So... It's important to recognize that the difference between anti-Pelagianism and sola fide is that anti-Pelagianism is a wider thesis. So you can include lots of views in it, which are not sola fide. And this is part of the problem. Sometimes people come to the patristic text and they see a lot of anti-Pelagian language. And this actually happened to the reformers. Um, and they kept claiming Augustine for their position on justification, and they initially, Luther and Melanchthon in particular, confused Augustine's position of being anti-Pelagian with being pro sola fide until they finally, Luther and Melanchthon, and eventually Calvin as well, all capitulated that Augustine did not teach uh, sola fide. He was very anti-Pelagian. He's the paradigm case of, of being an anti-Pelagian. Anti and that's gonna be part of the problem, I think, with Mr. Rogers' presentation that we'll see as we go through is that his position of having any kind of merit under the power of grace, um, if, if that's to be excluded, if that's a false gospel, um, if that's worthy of condemnation and you should reject that, well, then Augustine, the, the guy who's defending the doctrine of grace, is on that account is also a Pelagian and of sorts and teaches a false gospel. That I, I think that's a little absurd. So it's important, though, to keep anti-Pelagianism and sola fide um, different. Sola fide is a much narrower um, thesis, okay? So what I want you to do is, remember I told you to take a, a, a screenshot of that list, right, of sola fide, defining it. I want you to use that as a checklist as we start to go through some of the text that uh, Mr. Rogers uh, proposed. And most of these initial ones are all going to be from his first video. And I'm just using the text as I lovingly and sacrificially transcribed them, sat there and typed them all in based on what he had on the screen. Um, and so you'll be able to see at the bottom the timestamp. That's roughly where this occurs. So that will be in this first video on just sola fide in the, in the Church Fathers. So when you've got your checklist, I want you to start looking at it. 
and then C, is there anything in the text that expresses or exhibits those ideas? So this is from Methodius. He says, therefore, O Lord, I seek of thee to be allowed to depart. I have seen thy salvation. Let me be delivered from the bent yoke of the letter, obviously referring to the law. I have seen the king eternal to whom no other succeeds. Let me be set free from this servile and burdensome chain. I have seen him who is by nature my Lord and deliverer. May I obtain then his decree for my deliverance. Set me free from the yoke of condemnation and place me under the yoke of justification. Well, is there any created righteousness there being talked about? Is there faith as an empty or worthless virtue? Um, faith as an instrumental cause, a conduit of justification? Is there a forensic statement being made there about um you know only being classified uh, apart from your nature or what you really are um separation of activities no there's not there's nothing there there's no expression of sola fide or any of the constituents of sola, sola fide this is entirely compatible with just a plain old anti-pelagian reading Right? Any Catholic, any Orthodox, any Coptic, any Assyrian, uh, people in, you know, uh, Church of India, they could all agree to this. There's nothing distinctively Protestant about this text. Okay. So he says, deliver me from the yoke of the curse and of the letter that killeth and roll me in the blessed company of those who by grace of this thy true son, who is of equal glory and power with thee, have been received into the adoption of sons. So this was another text that Mr. Rogers quoted. Again, go through your checklist. But what do you see? All you ask for deliverance. There's nothing specified here in the mechanism of the deliverance. There's nothing here about faith being an instrumental cause, just, justification being quantitative. Now, I need to be clear. I'm not looking for those specific technical terms. I'm looking for terms that would tell me that those ideas behind those technical terms are actually in the text. So don't make the mistake and think that I'm looking for a precise, you know, formulation, like a creedal statement or anything like that. I'm not. All I'm looking for are indicators in the text that would tell me what idea is being expressed. So again, using your sola fide checklist, do you, do you see faith as an empty virtue, a created righteousness? change in classification. Um, all I see is a general statement for a plea for deliverance from the law, um, right? So there's really no sola fide or any of its constituents being expressed there. So next we come to a text that Mr. Rogers put forward from uh, Ambrose, right? Um, Ambrose, uh, who was the teacher of St. Augustine says, for he was not begotten uh, as is every man by intercourse, so speaking of Christ between male and female, because Christ is born of a virgin, right? Born of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin. He received a stainless body, which not only no sins polluted, but which neither of the generation nor conception had been stained by any admixture of defilement. And that's pretty much just virginal conception and virgin birth. For we men are all born under sin, and our very origin is in evil. As we read in the, in the words of God, for lo, I was conceived in wickedness, and in my sin my mother bring me forth. Therefore, the flesh of Paul was a body of death, right? It's obviously referring to Romans 7, as he himself says, who shall deliver me from the body of death. But the flesh of Christ condemned sin, which he felt not at his birth, crucified by his death, so that in our flesh there might be justification through grace, in which before there had been pollution by guilt. Okay? So... Again, take out your checklist and start looking through it. Um, now, you might focus on, as Mr. Rogers did, this idea at the bottom here of pollution by guilt. Um, well, not everybody has a 16th century concept of guilt as being forensic or external or pretty, pretty entirely nominal or anything like that. Um, look at the preceding text. What does the text tell you? Is it talking about legal categories in some kind of very refined nominalist way? Or is it talking about actual states of nature? 
Christ is born, right? That's without intercourse. It's talking about nature. It's sinless, right? Uh, we're all born under sin, right? Our origin is evil. So we're still talking about things dealing with nature. Uh, our conception. Oh, look, there's the body of death. I'm pretty sure the body of death or death is not forensic. Uh, it would be nice if it just was, but it's not. Um, now it says, the, but, but the flesh of Christ condemned sin. So that's an interesting phrase. And we'll see why in later in Ambrose, uh, what he thinks. But it's important to understand, for example, in other figures like St. Athanasius, if you read Contra Gentis or you read On the Incarnation or his other works, where he talks about sin and death, he doesn't talk about them in these kind of um, nominalist categories. He talks of them in terms of an inner principle that's at work kind of piggyback onto our nature and is actually working its way out through through our nature. Um, so it's entirely possible that Ambrose has something like that in mind when he talks about condemned uh, sin, right? Because Paul talks like that. He condemned uh, in, I believe, Romans 8, right? When the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, Ambrose thinks Christ was ontologically uh, a sinner, because sometimes patristic figures talk about sin in narrow and wide senses. Sometimes they talk about sin in terms of weaknesses of human nature um, that Christ took on and that he kind of lured, we'll see this later, that he lured all the powers to the cross uh, in, by that weakness. But I think you'll notice here, there's nothing here that's indicative of sola fide. It's entirely possible to read this entire text without having any of the con constituents of sola fide present. So, therefore, in accordance, this is another text that Mr. Rogers cites, therefore, in accordance with nature, excessive grease must not be yielded to, lest we seem either to claim for ourselves either an exceptional, exceptional superiority of nature or to reject the common lot. Oh, look, there's another natural term. For death is alike to all, without difference for the poor, without exception for the rich. And so, although through the sin of one alone, yet it passed upon all. That seems for Ambrose to be some kind of natural transmission. That we, so it's not, it's not the reform, probably not the reform doctrine of forensic imputation of Adam's sin. I think most reform scholars would agree that that's not what Ambrose has in mind. Continuing, that we may not refuse to acknowledge him to be also the author of death, whom we do not refuse to acknowledge as the author of our race, and that through one death is ours, so should also be the resurrection, and that we should not refuse the misery that we should that we may obtain, attain to the gift. For as we read, Christ has come to save that which was lost and to be the Lord of the dead and the living. In Adam I fell, in Adam I was cast out of paradise, in Adam I died, guilty as I was in him, so now justified in Christ. If then by death, the dead of all, we must be able to endure the payment. But this topic must be reserved for a later treatment. Okay, so Mr. Rogers focused in on a few things here. But notice first that the previous um, first half of the quote is all about a kind of natural state that we're in, right? And then resurrection, too, is also with respect to nature. It's nature in a glorified or deified form, but it's also it's it's not legal. Right. And in the second half, he focuses on um, falling in Adam. Well, there are lots of positions. Uh, for example, Augustine's position, who was a student of Ambrose, uh, does not believe in the reformed view of uh, forensic imputation of Adam's sin. He believes that um, sin is kind of inherited. There's an inherited guilt. Uh, and Ambrose does as well. So there's nothing here um, in this corporate language that has to be interpreted uh, in any kind of forensic sense. Now, guilty as I was in him, that could express a uh, distinctive. Um, but again, why are you guilty? Well, because you've received this, you have this common genealogy, you have a common source, right? So now justified in Christ. Okay, well, does Ambrose tell us what justified in Christ means? Does he spell that out? Does he give us an analogy so we can get our head around what justified in Christ means for him? No, it's just there, right? It does talk about debt, but again, as I mentioned with 
St. Athanasius, and we'll see this with Ambrose, and, and it's true in Augustine, debt is understood in terms of a kind of natural condition, right? It's the consequences that we have. Um, we must all be able to endure the payment, like we're all going to die. Uh, there's nothing here, I think, if you go down your, your sola fide checklist that expresses anything that's distinctive to um, sola fide, right? So um, next up from Ambrose, he who contends what he, ha what he, what he hopes for, well, there is a struggle, there is a crown. You contend in the world, but you are crowned. And for the struggles of this world, you are crowned. Now listen to this. For although the reward is in heaven, uh-oh, the merit for the reward is established here. Why is Ambrose, if those previous quotes, for example, were expressing some constituent of sola fide, why is Ambrose in his work on the sacraments talking about merit being established here? He's not talking about the incarnation. He's not talking about a created righteousness that Christ earns and then kind of legally transfers to our bank account or something like that. Maybe Ambrose is a merit monger, right? Now, I remember I mentioned this article by Smith. He has an excellent gloss on or interpretation uh, and argument that he gives. So I highly recommend that article if you want to get your head in Ambrose, uh, his soteriology. Smith says, and perhaps by that we are not, uh, not justified by works, but by faith, because the weakness of the flesh is a hindrance to works, but the brightness of faith, so this is actually him, I'm sorry, this is him uh, citing Ambrose. Uh, but the brightness of faith puts the, the error that is in uh, man's deeds, there's another spelling error, in the shadow. Now notice this, Ambrose says, right? Faith, what? Merits for him the forgiveness of sins. So Ambrose is quite comfortable with the language of merit with respect to faith. He's not thinking of it in terms of a zero-sum game. Now, this text doesn't tell us what he means by merit. It doesn't cash out a theory of merit. But the language is there. And the language is actually quite pervasive through uh, Ambrose's corpus. Uh, if you read on the mysteries or on the sacraments, it's all over the place. There's a number of places where he talks like this um, and in many other works. And uh, here we go. Mr. Smith comments, faith here is a quality or disposition or a virtue of the soul. Ambrose does not employ any te technical vocabulary, which is sufficiently meritorious that it, like the fragrant fragrance of Esau's clothing, gives to us the quality of righteousness the Father loves and blesses with the pardon of sin. So basically Ambrose's idea is that uh, Christ works takes away the fear of that is in his arcane, in arcane incarnation, resurrection, things like this, takes away the fear of punishment for all of humanity, and that this allows for courage and the possibility of faith, and God rewards this with pardoning all of that person's past sins. Thus, Ambrose, he writes, presents us with the picture of baptism as pardoning by sin, by restoring in humanity the quality of faith that we lost in the fall. Baptism becomes the moment of justification for the Christian because in baptism, the catechumen receives the gift of faith. That disposition of the soul, notice, disposition of the soul, it's not forensic, it's in, it's not outside. Characteristic of humanity before the fall, that is meritorious in God's eye. It's pleasing to God. In other words, it is the regenerative work of baptism, generating faith in the soul that, oh, there's that word again. Um, Sriracha's not going to be happy. Uh, merits justification. Okay. Yet the soul bearing the righteousness of faith is acceptable to God because the righteousness of faith He's here he's citing Ambrose, scatters the savor of Christ's merits, right? It kind of spreads it around, 
right, on the believer. Faith, therefore, is meritorious, not because it's some strict merit for Ambrose, because it is an extension of Christ's righteousness. Now, this is a really important point because you'll notice in Mr. Rogers' presentation and in many other Reformed or sometimes Lutheran presentations, they're always speaking of your merits versus Christ's merits. And so if you're claiming any kind of merit or pleasing God that your acts please God, born of grace, right, that um, you have grace first and then you do these pleasing things, that you're questioning the sufficiency of Christ. Well, so you must believe Christ didn't do at all because they're thinking of human nature and divine nature as these kind of self-enclosed things that can't participate in any way. But for Catholics and Orthodox and others, we don't think of it like that. We're thinking of our acts born of grace by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory is no longer I who live, but what? Christ lives in me. That these acts are actually Christ's acts. That's why it's an extension of Christ's righteousness. It's not competitive. And this is a, a fundamental mistake that I think Mr. Rogers and other Reformed people make. And when they do this, all they're doing is attacking a straw man. They're attacking a position that traditional Christians um, just don't hold. And part of the reason for that is because the uh, Reformation was um, got kicked off by that intrusion of semi-Pelagianism uh, through uh, various scotistic and uh, alchemistic thinkers like Gabriel Beale. And then Luther was very limited in what he knew in terms of the external um, scholastic tradition outside of Beale and that school. And so he just generalized uh, to the entire scholastic tradition, which is ironically why when Luther first began his protest, it was the Dominicans, the Thomists, who were the enemies of the Via Moderna, who actually agreed with a number of Luther's points, because they had been arguing that uh, what was going on with um, this idea that you could, by contrition, move yourself to faith or prepare yourself to faith apart from grace, that that was not genuinely Augustine's teaching. Uh, but again, because those acts of the Synod of Orange were lost, they didn't have any conciliar ground. But again, if you're if you're framing the matter in terms of it's my acts versus Christ's acts, and you're not seeing it in terms of Christ's acts and my acts are united, that they form a unity, then you're just attacking a straw man. So here we see Smith says the repetition of Ambrose understanding of meritorious virtue. So virtue, faith has an inherent value as that condition or quality of the soul necessary to receive grace. Humility merits grace because it is a disposition of openness to God's gift as gift, not as right. So merit here is not the idea in Ambrose of you have a right to it. Just because it's pleasing to God, God gives you credit for it, so to speak. It's not on the basis of obligation. God isn't obligated to do this. It's gratuitous merit, you might say. Paradoxically, Smith continuing says, the humility of prayer merits grace precisely because it renounces its claim to God's blessing and does not presume the blessing is an entitlement. So this is why when Mr. Rogers and others are making these kinds of arguments that, well, you're entitled to it. Um, if it's merit, then you're, you know, God had to give it to you. That's not what Ambrose has in mind. It's not what Augustine has in mind. Uh, it's not what any anti-Pelagian that I've ever read has in mind when they talk about merit. Thus, justification for Ambrose is not being treated as if one were righteous, Smith says, but being made righteous. Thus, the merit by which we are justified comes from the actual change that God has wrought in the believer. Through the cultivation of faith, we smell like Christ because in faith, we actually have become like Christ. Now, what's what's part of the point of this? I'm using Smith to illustrate that Mr. Rogers used those texts as if they were expressing either constituents of sola fide or the idea itself. And it's just not there. You saw for yourself using the checklist that there aren't any distinctive ideas of sola fide being or constituent ideas being expressed there. 
Um, and Smith is not some uh, outlier scholar. There are a number of scholars on Ambrose. So this isn't saying something that's, uh, you know, fringe. So thus the merit by which we are justified comes from the actual change that God has wrought. Oh, I already said that. Okay, silly me. Next, next slide. So next, Mr. Um, uh, Rogers um, goes to Polycarp's uh, epistle. And I apologize if this um, text is a little bit hard to read because of the size. So next time I'll try and do a better job. Um, I will buy, be posting the slideshow later on at my blog. So if people want to download it, I'll try to correct that. Um, if you want to show it at your church or something. In any case, what does the text say, right? Um, but when our wickedness had reached its height and it had been clearly shown that its reward, punishment, and death was impending over us, and when the time had come when God had appointed before manifesting his own kindness and power, how the one love of God through exceeding regard for men did not regard us with hatred, nor thrust us away, nor remember our iniquity against us, but showing great long suffering bore with us, he himself took on him the burden of our iniquities. He gave his own son as a ransom for us. Ooh, ransom. Ooh, that's the ransom theory. That's not, uh, that's probably not penal substitution there. Uh, the holy one for transgressors, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, this incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for those who are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? But what other one uh what other one was it possible that we the wicked and ungodly could be justified then by the only son of god oh sweet exchange oh unsearchable operation activity oh benefit surpassing all expectation that the wickedness of many should be held in a single righteous one and that the righteousness of the one should justify many transgressors um having therefore convinced us in the former time that our nature was unable to attain to life and having now revealed the Savior who was able to save even those things which it was formerly impossible to save, both by both these facts, he desired to lead us to trust in Christ, or excuse me, to trust in his kindness, to esteem him our nourisher, father, teacher, counselor, healer, our wisdom, light, honor, glory, power, life, so that we should not be anxious concerning clothing or food. So using your checklist, start looking for things that you might think are expressing constituents of sola fide. Now, usually, and this is what Mr. Rogers did, people latch on to the idea of an exchange. And they say, see, there's that forensic imputation there. My sins are imputed to Christ. He's classified as sinner and his righteousness, his created righteousness is uh, imputed to me and I'm classed as just even though I'm not, simul used its epicotter, bada bing, bada boom, we're done. Nope. There's lots of ways things can be exchanged. There are different theological systems that can use the same language and do use the same language. Um, that the wickedness of many should be hid in a single righteous one. Um, that can be explained in different different ways. There's nothing here um, that requires forensic imputation, a created righteousness, faith as an instrumental virtue, a separation activities, a transfer of created merit. Um, there is an exchange, and it's a good one. Um, we get benefits, but there's nothing there that says the benefits are just extrinsic to us. So for these reasons, I don't think that there's anything here that is expressing sola fide. Now, is it possible that Polycarp had that in his head? Yeah, it's possible. But then the question is, how would we know? Well, we would know based on the text, because that's what we have, because we don't have Polycarp's head, right? So we have to look at the text. So uh, the other thing that people might point to is, for what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? So they might be thinking of covering in terms of uh, a forensic label, but that's also that can also be covered in terms of covering over, blotting out, getting rid of, putting aside, things like this. Um, this is the way different church fathers understand this kind of language. So it's entirely possible for Polycarp to be expressing that idea. 
Notice my argument here is not what Polycarp is in fact expressing. My argument is that the language, the surface grammar here is compatible with more than one soteriological system. This is entirely compatible with it, just a general anti-Pelagian uh, understanding. Augustine could agree to this, and Augustine did not believe in solipidae. All right, let me see here real quick. Um, also, there's no imputation of, of guilt to Christ. Um, the emphasis is on the inability to attain life, not forensic innocence. Um, let me see. We are, he says, we are made able, quote unquote, to enter the kingdom of God. Not that we're reclassified, but we are made able. Well, that sounds like some of the stuff from Ambrose. And we'll see some of the other uh, patristic figures. So um, next up, we have a comment from D.H. Williams, who wrote an article who deals with this quote and many others. And he says, in none of these instances, none, zero, can one say that we are witnessing the initial expounding of a doctrine of justification by faith. It is accurate to say only that they are occasional moments of direct reflection on Pauline theology during the first three centuries. And when these instances do occur, there's often recognition that the righteous are made righteous by faith. Uh, and I believe Williams is a Protestant as well. So next uh, text that Mr. Rogers brings up to express at least some of the constituents of Sola Fide is uh, Basil of uh, Caesarea, who was the elder brother of Gregory of Nyssa and friend, uh, somewhat annoying friend, to uh, Gregory the Theologian or Nancy Ansis. So uh, let's go through this text. Again, use your Sola Fide checklist and keep an eye out for anything that might express those concepts. No sensible man then will be proud of his wisdom or of possessing the other goods I have mentioned. Uh, this is a homily on humility, by the way. But we'll follow the excellent advice of Blessed Anna and the prophet Jeremiah. Let not wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the strong man glory in his strength, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But what is true glory? Oh, that's an interesting phrase, true glory. And what makes, him, um, what makes a man great? In this, says the prophet, let him that glory glorieth glory that he understandeth and know that i am the lord this constitutes the highest dignity of man this is his glory and greatness truly to know what is great and cleave to it and seek after glory from the lord of glory the apostle tells us he that glorieth make glory in the lord saying christ was made for us uh wisdom justice uh with wis wisdom of god justice sanctification and redemption that as it is written he that glory may glory in the lord now, this is the perfect and consummate glory in God, not to exalt in one's own justice, but recognizing oneself as lacking true justice. To be justified by faith in Christ alone. Paul gloried in despising his own justice and in seeking after justice by faith, which is of God through Christ, that he might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death so as to attain to the resurrection of the dead Herewith topples the whole lofty pinnacle of erical pride. Now, you probably latched on to the phrase justified by faith in Christ alone, right? The sola fide slogan there. Um, now, we saw with Pelagius that he was quite comfortable. In fact, in his other epistles, I think a total, he he talks about justification by Christ, uh, by justification by faith alone. Um two or three dozen times. So it's it's strewn across his corpus. Pelagius didn't mean what Protestants mean by justification by faith alone. So why do does Mr. Rogers get to assume that just because he's seeing the words that it means what people a thousand years later meant? He doesn't get to assume it. He has to prove it. And so what he would have to do is provide an analysis of this text and all of Basil's corpus to see how he talks about soteriology, how he talks about the relationship of faith, how he conceives of justice and justification and all these things. But we don't get that with Mr. Rogers. Now, that would be a pretty heavy burden, but that's what it would take to prove um, that he's expressing the same concept. You just can't look at the terms and say, well, it says faith, faith in Christ alone. Um, 
And one of the interesting things here is that historically, this was a problematic text. Not that the actual text was problematic, but that Philip Melanchthon actually modified and changed the text. Um, Measuring, I believe, talks about this in his book on uh, Melanchthon and, uh, and patristics, that Melanchthon changed the text so that it would say faith uh, alone in Christ. He, um, I believe that was the wording. He changed it around uh, and altered the text. And that's part of the problem that when you read, for example, Chemnitz's treatment of the Council of Trent, or you read Melanchthon or other sources, um, a lot of these altered texts get get thrown around at the period, which caused no matter of con- uh, no small amount of confusion. So let's look at a few other things. Christ was made for us wisdom of God. Okay, justice, sanctification, redemption. Fine. We should glory in the Lord. So I'm reading down here at the second half. Uh, this is the perfect and consummate glory in God. Not to exalt in one's own justice. Well, that might be expressing a sola fide view, but it's entirely compatible with an anti-Pelagian view. Because remember, anti-Pelagians don't think that the justice that pleases God that they have inherently is their own. It's not of their own making in the sense that they're the source of it, right? In Ephesians 2, it is not of yourselves, right? Like Jesus says, for example, my kingdom is not of this world right? Its power does not come from this world. He didn't say my kingdom is not in this world. He just says it's not of this world. So the same idea here is the justice is not one's own. So that's entirely compatible with an anti-Pelagian and non sola fide reason. Recognizing oneself as lacking true justice. Well, here's a fun question for Basil, who's something of a metaphysical realist. Um, What do you think he thinks true justice is? Does he think that true justice is a created justice? Or does he probably think of it in terms of God's actually being just? So what kind of justice do you get? Do you get a created knockoff? Or do you get God's actual justice? Right? So what is true justice there? To be justified by faith in Christ alone. Right. Great. I agree with that. Right. Because, for example, he could be easily expressing that faith is the condition of justification. It's something that pleases God. We see plenty of other people at the time period um, who have the same basic view. We'll see some of this later on. All right. So moving on from this material from Basil, there's some more material from Basil. Um, These are some incidental notes. We'll go through these quickly. Would that man had abided in glory, which he possessed with God, he would have had genuine instead of a fictitious dignity. This is from the same homily. This is not from a different sort. So Basil is able to distinguish between something that might be fictitious or might be extrinsic and something that's genuine. Now, I'm not trying to take a dig here in terms of legal fiction argument. All I'm pointing out is that Basil can make these kinds of distinctions or distinctions that are at least in the ballpark. Next, speaking of people who are arrogant, they lord it over others who raise them to such an honor and exalt themselves or the very ones at whose hands they received their sham distinctions. The position they occupy is entirely out of keeping with reason, for they possess a glory more unsubstantial than a dream. So there, so he has an idea of a fake glory. It's not substantial. So real glory for him is going to be what? Something substantial. It's not going to be probably taxonomic. If it is, we need some other text from Basil, which Mr. Rogers does not supply, to get us to that idea. Uh, Basil, again, the same homily. He did not so much injure him who he hoped to alienate, talking about the devil, This is just an interesting aside from God in eternal life as he betrayed himself, becoming as he did a rebel against God, doomed to death forever. Take that universalist. He was himself caught in the snare he laid for the Lord. Uh Uh-oh, this isn't PSA. This isn't penal substitutionary atonement. He was nailed. The devil was nailed to the cross upon which he hoped to crucify him. He died the death wherein he intended the Lord to be destroyed. So here's an interesting aside. Penal substitutionary atonement was a theory that was created and constructed to accommodate sola fide, not the other way around, which is why it came later historically in terms of Reformation theology. So if you don't have PSA, 
it's going to be much more likely that you don't have justification by faith alone. Same homily. Not, oh man, remains for, for you to boast of. Remember, keep that sola fide checklist out. Inasmuch as your glory and your hope consist in mortifying yourself. Ooh, mortifying. Like mortify the deeds of the flesh. In all things and striving towards the life to come in Christ, the foretaste of this life we now enjoy. So we have some of it now. And we are already in possession of its goods, living as we do directly by the grace and gift of God. Okay. God it is who worketh in us both the will and to accomplish according to his good will. God also reveals through his own spirit his wisdom, which is ordained unto our glory. It is God who grants efficacy to our labors. Wow, Augustine would be just happy with that. I have labored more abundantly than, than all they, says Paul, yet not I. Not I. Here, here we see that coalescence of activities. God delivers from dangers which are beyond all human recourse. We had in ourselves, says Paul, the answer of death. So the death is this in, inherent thing that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who hath delivered and, and doth deliver us out of so great dangers, in whom we would trust that he will yet also deliver us. Why then pray do you glory in your, in your goods as if they were your own instead of giving thanks to God, to the giver for his gifts? For what hast thou th that thou hast not received? Now, this is a really important text. Because if you read Augustine, particularly his anti-Pelagian works, it starts in, I believe, in his commentary on Galatians, which is before he kind of changes his theology a little bit. But he hammers this text a lot. When he's arguing with the Pelagians, with Julian of Anclonum and Pelagius, this is his text. And if thou hast received, was, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received? You have not known God by reason of your justice, but God has known you by reason of his goodness. After that, you, you have known God, says the apostle, or rather are known by God. You did not apprehend Christ because of your virtue, but Christ apprehended you by his coming. Now, what is Basil expressing here? Anything you have in terms of merit, you have it because you received it from God. That's a really great pre-Augustinian anti-Pelagian text, right? Because it's denying that you have any righteousness of your own natural ability. Um, and any righteousness you have comes from God. And people will be saying, maybe saying, well, see, that's that's sola fide there. But again, Augustine and plenty of anti-Pelagians believe this as well. There's no reason to take it in some kind of nominalist sense. At least there's no reason based on this text. All it is is a thesis about origination. The righteousness does not originate in you. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist in you. It just means you're not the ultimate source of it. You're not the primary cause. God is the primary cause. So here in this text, we can see, I think there are no indicators of sola fide as well. And then rounding out from the same homily, homily 20 on humility, judgment will be in accordance with grace. And the judge will make examination, now look at this, of how you have used the graces bestowed upon you. If you do not understand that you have received grace and by an excess of stupidity, ascribe to yourself the success, which is a gift of grace, you will fare no better than St. Peter. Indeed, you will not be able to surpass in love for the Lord, him who loved him so ardently that he desired to die for him. So again, you have this basic um, origination thesis that you aren't the origin uh, of this. And you're going to be judged based on what use you made of them. Again, the stern Pharisee, Basil says in homily 20, who in his overweening pride, not only boasted of himself, but also discredited the publican in the presence of God, made his justice void by being guilty of pride. The publican went down justified in preference to him. Now, what was the ground, I want to ask, what is the ground of the publican's justification? Because he had given glory to God, Basil says, the Holy One, and did not dare lift up his eyes. Remember, this is a sermon on humility. 
but sought only to win mercy, accusing himself by his posture, by striking his breast, and by answering no motive other than propitiation. So for Basil, what is the ground of the publican's justification? Is it a created righteousness that's accredited to him based on an, an instrumental cause? Is he reclassified? Is there any language there of reclassification? No. Rather, Basil explains it in terms of an inner disposition that he has. Many times by examining, Basil says the whole, and this is important, not taking the part only into account, you will find that he is better than you, talking about other people. But God does not only examine man according to the part, for he says, I came together, um, their work to gather, excuse me, should be a space there, gather their works and thoughts. Furthermore, when he rebuked Josephat for sin committed in an unguarded moment, he mentioned also the good he had done, saying, but good works are found in thee. What is Basil's argument here? This is entirely consistent with the notion of righteousness being qualitative. God doesn't take into account necessarily, with respect to somebody's standing, according to Basil, that they have some sins over here, right? He takes into account the whole of it. So next up, Ambrosiaster, who is still to this day, as far as I understand, an anonymous figure. So he could be a church father or he might not be a church father, which is an interesting digression here for just a moment. Because uh, when we get to Marius Victorinus and other figures, Mr. Rogers was convinced, um, I don't know why, but he was convinced that Marius Victorinus was a church father. Uh, as far as I know, Marius Victorinus was never canonized by the Catholic Church. He was never canonized by the Orthodox Church. He was never canonized by the cops or anyone else. I think there might be some confusion as to what constitutes a church father. Now, maybe Mr. Rogers has a different definition of church fathers, has his own definition. But I don't know what that is because he hasn't told us. So he needs to set down, maybe it would be helpful to set down a criteria for what he thinks constitutes a church father. Before just saying, well, of course, so-and-so was a church father. Well, that's not a criteria, right? Because at least in my church, in the Orthodox Church, I'm pretty sure he's not considered a church father. We'll see why later on. In any case, with Ambrosiaster, this is one of the texts that Mr. Rogers used. So again, you're going to use that sola fide checklist. This refers to somebody who is bound by sin and who therefore does not do what the law commands. Paul says this to an ungodly person, that is to a Gentile, who believes in Christ without doing the works of the law. His faith is reckoned for righteousness, just as Abraham's was. How then can the Jews think that they've been justified by words, excuse me, should be works of the law, in the same way as Abraham, when they see Abraham was not justified by works of the law, but by faith alone. So what do we want to look at here? Reckoned for righteousness. Well, is faith there a instrumental cause or a condition of righteousness? So, for example, Augustine thinks that faith, as I said before, is a pleasing virtue. And God accepts that instead of works righteousness. That's what it means to be the condition of, right? That's how Augustine uses reckoned for righteousness. He accepts it as. So I'm not saying that's being expressed here, but it is possible. And there's nothing in the text that indicates an instrument faith as an instrumental or intrinsic or ex, instrumental or extrinsic cause so then he says at the bottom but by faith alone okay does ambrosiaster in this text that mr rogers cite cash this out no does he tell you what faith alone really means for him no so all we have is the phrase again pelagius uses the phrase the guy who believes in works righteousness he uses the term faith alone, and the arch enemy of him who doesn't believe in that, who believes in, in salvation by grace, um, doesn't use the phrase faith alone. So you can't just go on the basis of seeing those words. You have to prove that's what Ambrosiaster has in mind. So again, I don't think that there's anything here that expresses the Protestant doctrine of faith alone. 
Next text. Therefore, there is no need of the law when the ungodly person is justified before God by faith alone. Thus, Paul says that it has been decreed by God that when the law comes to an end, the grace of God will be demand faith alone for salvation. All right. So, um, does Ambrose Aster in this text tell us what he means by faith alone? No. Now, there is a volitional aspect that God decrees that something will happen, but that's not exhibiting or expressing an instrumental cause, right? So there's nothing in this text that exhibits the Protestant conception behind the words faith alone. Now, again, I'm not in a position where I need to argue what Ambrosiaster means in these texts. I can and we'll look at that in a moment. But all I need to point out is the surface grammar here is not sufficient to know what he means. Because again, you can use the terms and mean something very different by them. So if Pelagius can use them and other people can use them who are not uh, advocates of sola fide can use that language, well, then you need more than just that phrase. So next, text Mr. Rogers uses. But Paul backs this up by the example of the prophet David, who says that those who are blessed of whom God has decreed, but that without work or any keeping of the law, they are justified by God before God by faith alone. Therefore, he tells the blessedness of the time when Christ was born, just as the Lord himself says, many prophets and righteousness, righteous men long to see what you see and to hear what you hear and to not hear it. Okay. Now, let's think of it this way. Use your checklist, and you're probably thinking without, without work or any keeping of the law, they are justified by God by faith alone. Again, does this mean faith is the condition of justification? It's the ground of it? It's a virtue that's pleasing to God? Or does it mean it's an instrumental cause for the transfer of created righteousness? Does the text tell you? Maybe there's something else in Ambrosiaster that expresses that there's not I actually read the whole commentary but there's nothing in this text that tells us which one of those understandings is being expressed this is why this text also does not express um sola fide so um Suter, who wrote one of the most important works on earliest Latin commentaries on the epistles of St. Paul says, speaking of Ambrosiaster, when he uses the expression sola fides, he, like other early writers, refers merely to the forgiveness of sins offered at baptism. So again, this is right in line with what we saw from Ambrose. And Ambrose is really just fine with merit. So there's no reason here to take Ambrosiaster um, as exp as expressing the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. Because he thinks that this has to do with regeneration at baptism. Next, we look at Carlson, who wrote um, a work on justification in earlier med medieval theology. Carlson writes, but the concept, speaking of Ambrosiaster, is consistently stated in terms of a sharp antithesis between faith and law specifically the Jewish ceremonial law. Hence, freedom from the law is given a very specific historical connotation in the Jewish background of the Christian faith. This is consistent with many other references to the Jews. There is consistently no hint of a more universalized interpretation of Pauline freedom from a law of works. What is Carlson saying here? He's saying that as far as Ambrosiaster is concerned, he takes works of the law to just be the ceremonial law. He doesn't necessarily take them to be, um, or there's no evidence, no hint, of a wider notion of it referring to the law's moral precepts. Now, later, Augustine does, and other people do, but Ambrosiaster doesn't. Now, if he doesn't, that means he can't be expressing sola fide, or if he is, he's being incredibly inconsistent. So um, let's see here. This is from uh, beginning with the commentary. This is actually quoted in the introduction 
uh, in the introductory material, but it's found also in the text. So Ambrosiaster says, the cross signifies not the death of the sage savior, uh-oh, but the death of sin. Oh, that's not, doesn't sound like uh, penal substitutionary atonement there. An innocent who is killed in this way renders guilty those by whom he is killed. We should, however, understand sin to refer to the princes and powers through whose effort Adam first sinned. Well, this starts to sound like Christus Victor view of the atonement. For the term sin is to be referred to its authors, whose death the apostle indicates by their despoiling. The death of these princes and powers consists in this, that having been conquered by the Savior, they are put to death when they are despoiled of the souls with which, which they were holding in captivity. Now, just a side note, this ransom theory of the atonement um, is all over Ambrose Astor's commentary. It's over a number of his works. There's not a hint there of penal substitutionary atonement. And part of the problem is when people look at patristic texts, they see the word debt, um, suffering penalties, things like this. Um, there are plenty of people that Protestants agree did not believe in penal substitutionary atonement, like, I don't know, Aquinas. Um, and they all use that term. So you have the same kind of word concept fallacy going on. In any case, it's very clear here how Ambrosiaster understands the atonement. So next from his commentary, it is not hard to see that the apostle denies that circumcision of the flesh merits any praise in God's sight. Abraham was justified not because he was circumcised, but because he believed. He was circumcised afterward, circumcision of the heart, However, oh wait, look, circumcision of the heart, however, is praiseworthy in God's sight. So it's valuable for God. To circumcise the heart is to acknowledge the creator once error has been cut away. But circumcision of the heart was to come in the future. First Moses says, you will circumcise the hardness of your hearts. And likewise, Jeremiah, you circumcise the foreskin of your heart. He said this to the Jews who followed idols. There is a veil around the heart. The one who has turned toward God will cut away because faith removes the cloud of error and bestows perfect knowledge of God in the mystery of the Trinity, which had not been known by the ages. Therefore, such, circum such circumcision, there is praise from God, hidden from people. So it's inner, it's not outward. What God sees, uh-oh, is the merit of the heart, not the flesh. Oh, there's that merit again. So Ambrosiaster thinks that faith is meritorious, that it's pleasing to God. So why, after seeing this in the text, why was Abraham justified? Well, because he had the condition of justification. Faith was the condition. It wasn't an instrument for the transfer of moral credit. This is why Mr. Rogers' use of the other material from Ambrosiaster goes absolutely nowhere. It's very clear that he views faith as something that's valuable, even speaks of it in terms of merit. Um, that's just incompatible with sola fide. Next up, commenting on Romans 3.20. For through this revelation, God decreed that people are not justified through the law, which justifies for the time being, but not before God. Remember what Carlson said about Ambrosiaster and the law? It's ceremonial law. Those who keep the law are justified in the temporal world, but not before God, because faith through which people are justified before God is not present in them. So to be justified before God for Ambrosiaster, you, you have to have the faith in you. Faith is, in fact, greater than the law. Oh, because the law pertains to us while faith pertains to God. So we have an origination contrast there. This thing is relative to us. That thing is relative to God. That's why it's better. It's a qualitative difference. According the, accordingly, the law renders one just for a time, but faith renders one just for eternity. Now, by itself, that could be compatible with sola fide, but given what we just saw about Ambrosiaster earlier, that faith is praiseworthy uh, in and of itself, that seems to not be sola fide. He's talking about something else. He's talking about faith as the condition of justification. Next up, commenting on Romans 3.24, they are justified freely through his grace. They are justified freely. Now, you might think, oh, well, 
Perry, you messed up. Because they are sanctified by faith alone as a gift of God, they do nothing and render nothing in return. Perry, what are you, what are you thinking? Well, notice, they are justified freely. How does he cash that out in terms of sanctification? Remember, the Reformed always complain, oh, you're confusing justification and sanctification. They're separate. We have to keep them separate. Well, he explains justification in terms of sanctification. That's one reason why the phrase faith alone there can't mean, based on what's in the text, can't mean the Protestant idea. So they do nothing and render nothing in return. Yeah, that's that's a, a general statement, or at least could be easily read as a general statement, that you can't repay God, right? That's why in the judgment, all the people whom, whom Jesus judges and says to go to the sheep, they said, when did we ever see you do this, right? And, and then they say, what are we? We are unprofitable servants. There's no way you could repay God. It's, it's gratuitous. Commenting on Romans 3.30, for God has justified the Gentiles as well as the Jews in no other way than as believers. Since one, one God is the God of everyone, he has justified everyone on one basis. What then is the advantage of circumcision of the flesh? Or what is the disadvantage of circumcision when nothing but faith grants what? Status and merit. Now you may be thinking, well, status, all right. I'll be charitable. That could be a taxonomic classification remark, but not necessarily. Because remember, Ambrosiaster sees faith as the ground for justification. So status could be based entirely in his thinking on this inward state. So there's no reason in this text to take it um, as being entirely forensic or taxonomic. Commenting on Romans 4, 4, moreover, to be believed, to believe and not believe is a matter of the will, nor can anyone be forced to accept what is not evident. Rather, one is invited to accept. Uh-oh, Calvinist, sorry. Since one is not compelled. Oh, not compelled. I know you'll say we don't believe in compulsion. I know I use the same one. But is persuaded. This is why it accrues to one's credit, for one believes what one does not see, but rather hopes for. Okay, notice. This is why he's giving an explanation. Why what? It, faith, belief, accrues to one's merit or credit. So he's clearly viewing faith as meritorious. Again, it's not strict merit. It's not proportional. It's all under the grace of God. Commenting on Romans 4.18, this is why faith is so valuable. Contrary to what it sees and knows, it believes something will come to pass. For one is encouraged by this hope that it is God who promises, about whom it is right to conceive more than human weakness can grasp. So, notice, faith is valuable. Not only valuable, it's so valuable. Is it valuable because it's a conduit for the transfer of credit, like a transaction, like a financial transaction? Is there courtroom language here? Um, no. No. It's valuable because, contrary to what it sees and knows, it believes something will come to pass. That is, faith is valuable because of its very nature. So this is another reason why Ambrosiaster, in the, in the citations that Mr. Rogers uses, does not express sola fide. Comment on Romans 4.19, the apostle declares that Abraham is deserving of this praise. Because although he knew... That he did not have the capability, meaning the siring of Isaac, because he's so old. He strengthened his weakness with faith so that he believed that through God, he would be able to do what he knew was impossible according to the laws of this world. He thus possesses great merit. Uh-oh, merit. Why does he possess great merit? Because of his faith. That's in the preceding section. And he believed God against his own understanding and did not doubt that he, namely God, was able to do what he knew was impossible according to the reasoning of the world. In fact, he takes it as certain that God is beyond the reasoning of the world. So we got a little apophatic theology going on there. For no one can be said to exist within the thing he has uh, he has created. Therefore, Abraham should be what? 
rewarded by God in this way because he attributed more to his creator than he himself un understands. So Abraham was deserving, first line, he's deserving of praise. Why? Because of faith. Romans 4.23, to complete, uh-oh, complete our justification when the Savior rose. So our justification wasn't complete. He invested his commandments with authority so that by following them, we might, uh-oh, grow in the qualities through which we, having attained glory, may shine radiantly in the kingdom of God based on the pledge. It's probably a reference to baptism that we who have been justified cannot be held by death. So here you have the idea, very anti-Pelagian idea, that you grow in justice and that will complete what? Your sanctification, your progressive sanctification? No, your justification. Again, notice he talks about growing in qualities. So the analysis here, that's what's being expressed is a qualitative difference. And a qualitative increase, not a quantitative. Oh, here we go. So moving on, Mr. Rogers cites a number of texts from John Chrysostom. So the first text he cites um, from Chrysostom, to declare his righteousness, what is declaring of righteousness? So he's commenting on a Pauline passage. Like the declaring of his riches, not only for him to be rich himself, but also to make others rich or of life, not only that he himself, he is himself, but also, excuse me, he is himself living, but also that he makes the dead live or to live. And of his power, not only that he is himself powerful, but also that he makes the feeble powerful. So also is the declaring of his righteousness, not only that he himself is righteous, but that he also, but that he does also make them that are filled with the putrefying sores of the skin of sin, not skin, suddenly righteous. Now, um, Mr. Rogers, and I have a little bit of a tickle in my throat. That's why I'm sucking on a cough drop, so I'm going to torture you with a cough drop for a few moments. Mr. Rogers argues that because of the suddenly being made righteous, that this is incompatible with a classic Augustinian or anti-Pelagian account. So let's look at the text. What is declaring of righteous of righteousness? Well, it's not only for God to be rich, but to make others rich. It's not just that God lives, right? But that he makes the dead to live. He gives life. Well, none of these are forensic, right? And of his power, not only that he is, he is himself powerful, but that he makes the feeble powerful. So again, still not forensic. So also is the declaring of his righteousness, not only that he himself is righteous, that's not forensic. God isn't classed as righteous, irrespective of his nature, but that he does also make them that are filled with putrefying sores suddenly righteous. Now, part of the problem is that Mr. Rogers is assuming without argument that this is some kind of quantitative complete state that Chrysostom is talking about. There's nothing in the text that expresses that assumption or would indicate that assumption. And that's what he needs in order to make his argument to go through that this is incompatible with an anti-Pelagian uh, account. So secondly, it's not as if anti-Pelagians like Augustine and others think that um, you're not actually righteous or that it takes a long time to be righteous um, by the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. No, they think that you're actually righteous. They just think that you increase in that over time. So this is this text from Chrysostom is entirely compatible with um, an anti-Pelagian and non sola fide view. So next up from Chrysostom, uh, and it is to explain this, these, what is declaring that he has added that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Doubt not then, for it is not of works, but of faith, and shun not the righteousness of God, for it is a blessing in two ways, because it is easy and open to all men. And be not ashamed and shame-faced, for if he himself openly declares himself to do so, 
and he, so to say, finds a delight and pride therein, how do you come to be dejected and to hide your face at what the, your master glories in? Now, um, some people might be thinking, he says, do not, uh, doubt not then, for it is not of works, but of faith, and shun not the righteousness of God. Okay. Um, there's nothing here that requires or indicates that faith is an empty virtue, there's a created righteousness, that faith is an instrument of causation, there's a taxonomic change ungrounded in the state of the agent, uh, that there's creative merit, that this is quantitative. So yeah, there's no sola fide in this passage either. So this text also from homily seven that Mr. Rogers cites, and I give the indication there at one hour for the first period and six minutes. For before the pardon came was the time to prove it. But after it, it came, he would no longer have the season for boasting. And this happened in the Jews case, meaning basically if you're going to prove you're just, you ran out of time by the time the advent came because it's too late. For since they had been traitors to themselves, this is why he came by his very coming, doing away with their boasting. All right. For he who says that he is a teacher of babes and makes his boast in the law and styles himself an instructor of the foolish uh, should be is alike with them. He needed a teacher and a savior can no longer have any pretext for boasting. OK, so there's no pretext for boasting. All right. For even before this, the circumcision was made uncircumcision that is voided of no value. Much rather was it now, since it is cast out from both periods. But after saying that it was excluded, he says also, how? How then does he say it was excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but of the law of faith. So he's commenting on a Pauline passage on Romans. See, he calls the faith also a law delighting to keep the names, and so a lot allay the seeming novelty. But what is the law of faith? It is being saved by grace. Amen. Here he shows God's power in that he has not only saved, but has even justified and led them to boasting. And that this too, without needing works, but looking for faith only. And in saying this, he attempts to bring the Jew who is believed to act with moderation and to calm him that has not believed in such a way as to draw him onto his own view. For he that has been saved, if he be high-minded, in that he abides by the law, will be told that he himself has stopped his own mouth, himself accused himself, himself has renounced claims to his own salvation and has excluded boasting. But he that has not believed again, being humbled by these same means, will be capable of being brought over to the faith. Do you see how great faith's preeminence is? How, does, how it has removed us from the former things, not even allowing us to boast of them. Now, I want to focus in because we still have a lot of stuff to do. And if Sam needs to interject um, and cut this short, please let me know. Brother, but in any, yes, sir. take your time. No one's rushing you. We're here okay. listening attentively. So don't worry about time. Go ahead. Okay. So he says they're about a little over halfway down towards the right, at least my right, but looking for faith only, right? So he's justified us, right, without needing works, but looking for faith only. Now, this is compatible with seeing faith as the only initial condition for justification, right? Any anti-Pelagian could agree with this. There's nothing here about a created righteousness. Faith is an empty virtue. Um, a taxonomic change. There is a change. He's removed us from the former things, but taxonomic change isn't just some general removal. Um, it's something much more specific, and there's nothing in the text that requires us to take it as a taxonomic change. So again, my argument is not that I'm saying what John Chrysostom is expressing. My argument is that um, if he's expressing sola fide, there are no markers here that indicate that that's what he is expressing. Because again, all of that language of looking for faith only, of doing so without works. Remember what Ambrosiaster said, why was Abraham justified without works? 
because of his faith, which was valuable. That's all consistent with what Chrysostom says. So this is why this text does not teach or express sola fide either. Again, Chrysostom may have had that in mind, but again, we don't have his head here to have a conversation with him and say, what did you mean exactly? Did you mean this view or some other view? We have to look at the text. So um, next text that Mr. Rogers uses. Let us see, however, whether the brigand, that is the thief on the cross, gave evidence of effort, upright deeds, and a good yield. Far from his being able to claim even this, he made his way into paradise before the apostles with a mere word on the basis of faith alone. The intention being for you to learn that it was not so much a case of his sound values prevailing. And notice he says, not so much a case. So he's not necessarily excluding that whatever sound values are. He's not necessarily excluding that for everybody's simplicator. He's just saying in the case, this case here, prevailing as the Lord's loving kindness, being completely responsible. So what is the origination? It's the Lord's loving kindness. It's God's mercy. What in fact did the bring it say? What did he do? Did he fast? Did he weep? Did he tear his garments? Did he display repentance in good time? No, not at all. On the cross itself, after his utterance, he won salvation. Now, Mr. Rogers interprets this as works, all these things at the bottom, works as kind of, uh, at least he seemingly interprets it, works done kind of in your own natural power. And that's, I don't see any reason why to interpret works done by grace, Christ living in me, the hope of glory, uh, that way. Um, all Chrysostom here is mentioning is that he didn't have any of those other things and that faith was the root, right? The basis for his declaration. So what he's trying to do is cajole people and saying, look, you have to run to faith, right? That is the ground that is the beginning of everything. He's not here excluding in principle all those other things as being works of Christ through you or Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's just showing you how significant faith is. This is entirely compatible again with faith as a condition of justification. There's no instrumentality here. There's no faith as an empty virtue. There's no taxonomic reclassification. There's no transfer of created merit. Um, so this text doesn't express sola fide either. Again, I know people will harp on the term, uh, the phrase on the basis of faith alone, but again, Pelagius used those words. You can't just go by those words. You have to get to the ideas that the text is expressing and just using those words is not necessary or sufficient to express the Protestant, uh, doctrine. Next text that Mr. Rogers uses, note the rapidity. It means it happens fast. From cross to heaven, from condemnation to salvation. What were, what were those words, wonderful words then? What great power did they have that they brought him such marvelous good things? Remember me in your kingdom. What sort of word is that? He has to receive good things. He should no concern for them in action. But the one who knew his heart paid attention not to the words, but to the attitude of his mind. Now, what was the basis of Christ's judgment? According to the text, what did Christ pay attention to? Not to his words, but to his attitude of mind. So the basis of the judgment for Christ about the thief on the cross, the good thief, ironically, good thief, uh, is his inner disposition. There's no transfer of merit here. There's no uh, faith is empty in its in its own right. It's grounded in the state of the agent. There's an actual basis in the thief that Jesus uses to render a judgment. So again, this text does not express sola fide either. Rapidity is just that, okay, he died and he's straight in. Right? He didn't have any other life after the crucifixion, right? Other than eternal life. That's not indicative of a kind of completely legal uh, declaration. It's consistent with it. 
rapidity is consistent with it, but being consistent with and expressing are not necessarily the same things. Next text. Now, this is interesting uh, as an aside. This is not one of the texts that I believe Mr. Rogers uses. This is from Chrysostom's commentary on Matthew. From this, we learn an important doctrine, that people's goodwill is not enough if they are not in, in receipt of grace from on high. So that's a nice anti-Pelagian statement. And co-relatively, that we profit nothing from grace on high if goodwill is lacking. So you can receive grace and not have a good will, right? That's going to be a problem for Reformed theology. But these truths Judas and Peter demonstrate. Though one enjoyed much assistance, it did him no good because he lacked a good will and contributed nothing of his own. So what's his problem? He didn't have a good will and he contributed nothing. Whereas the latter, that is St. Peter, though full of good will, came to grief because he received no assistance. Virtue, you see, is woven from these two things. Hence, I urge you not to leave it up all up to God. Uh-oh. Chrysostom says you should not leave it all up to God. Maybe Chrysostom is a merit monger. Isn't that what Mr. Rogers was calling various people who talked about? They don't leave it all up to God. They want to have their little bit and make their claim. Well, Chrysostom says, I urge you. He urges you not to leave it all up to God and fall asleep, nor in a flurry of zeal, zeal to think you achieve the whole thing by your own efforts. So what are the errors? Doing nothing and thinking you do it all. The truth is in between. In fact, God does not want us to be lethargic. Hence, he's not doing everything himself. So wait, I thought on the Reformation doctrine, God did everything for you in terms of justification. He does it all. Well, Chrysostom says he doesn't do it all. Nor to be presumptuous, hence his not leaving it all up to us. Again, not leaving it up to us. Instead, he removed the harmful element in each option. That is the goodwill and assistance. And left to us the beneficial part. This is why he allowed even the thief, the excuse me, the chief apostle to fall, in reference to Peter, to render him less presumptuous and to prompt him to stronger love in the future. Scripture says, the person to whom more is forgiven will love more. So I think it's very clear. And there are lots of passages like this in Chris Austin. Um, this is certainly not compatible with justification by faith alone. So whatever Chris Austin means in those other texts, either he's seriously inconsistent or he has a different understanding of what faith alone means. Now we come to Jerome. So this is a text I believe that Mr. Rogers uses, and I gave the citation there from Patrologia Latinae. That's what the PL refers to, as opposed to Patrologia Graecae. Jerome, Mr. Rogers cites, for being ignorant of the justice of God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted themselves to the justice of God, not knowing that God justifies by, oh, there's that phrase again, faith alone, and thinking that they are just by the works of the law, which they did not observe. They would not submit to themselves, not submit themselves to the remission of sins, lest they should appear to have been sinners. Now, again, we have this faith alone here phrase. It could mean sola fide, but there's nothing here per se. It's just a difference between people who are ignorant of justice of God. They tried to establish their own, that is to be the source of their own justice. They didn't submit to God's justice. All right. That's just plain good old anti-Pelagian talk, all right? So if you look at your sola fide checklist, I think you'll see that there's nothing here that expresses sola fide. It says, thinking they are, that they are just by works of the law. Well, Jerome could, like Ambrosiaster, whom he knew, they were actually kind of enemies, um, could mean works of the law ceremonial. Or he could mean works the law apart from grace. Those are also possibilities. Um, there's nothing in the text here that expresses sola fide. So we have a problem, though, because um, this text is actually not from Jerome. It floats around on the Internet. 
and it's not from Jerome. Um, I will tell you who it's from. It's from Pelagius. It's actually a quote from Pelagius. It's not from Jerome. So again, we have another case of Jerome of uh, Pelagius teaching justification by faith alone. All right. Um, now, why is this significant? Well, first, and this is a little bit of history to explain. So in the ancient Christian commentary on scripture in volume six, and I put a question mark by page 13 because this was an electronic version that I had um, via an electronic reader and it didn't have um, pagination for, for this section. So I guesstimated. So you have to do a little control F to find it. But he says, similar to this work and evidently dependent on it um, is the commentary written by arch heretic Pelagius, which has survived because for many centuries it was thought to have been the work of Jerome. It is important because it allows Pelagius to speak for himself on subjects that were to land him in controversy with Augustine, like excommunication, and eventually lead to his condemnation. What we find is a man of moderate and even mainstream views. Though it has to be remembered that the text as we now have it was reworked in the 6th century by, by both Promasius and Cassidorus. Pelagius' original text was in specific ways presumed, presumably explicitly heretical. But what we have now is unexceptional, even if it is still possible to detect points of disagreement with Augustine. Now, yeah, I want to go back here. So... This is a pseudo Jeromean text, and there's a number of them. A number of Pelagius' commentaries get grouped and classified in the sixth century and further under the name of Jerome. And this causes no small amount of confusion. Why was the text reworked? Because figures saw, thought that this was from Jerome and thought Jerome can't, we can't let Jerome teach Pelagianism. He can't possibly be teaching that. So we're going to put in his real meaning. So then they altered the text. Okay. Cue the year 1516, which might be significant for Protestants because it's getting close to that 1517 year. This work of pseudo Jerome was published under Jerome's name in Europe. And the reformers started to make use of it. Well, why did they make use of it? Because, as you saw, it says God justifies by faith alone. So you have Luther and Melanchthon who are using this text from Pelagius to argue that it teaches justification by, that Jerome taught justification by faith alone. Now, what do we have with Mr. Rogers? We have the same exact thing happening because Mr. Rogers apparently did not read this book or really any of the academic literature about Pelagius and the history of commentary, Latin commentaries on Paul's epistle to the Romans. Because if you read any of that literature, Pseudo-Jerome comes up and comes up in a fair amount of sources. Uh, I have a number of books, Suter's book, uh, comes up in the Ambrosiaster commentary, comes up in lots of different places. Um, so, why is this important? The history is interesting, but for us it's important because remember I said the, the name of the program is Shapes in the Clouds, seeing patterns that just aren't there. Well, Mr. Rogers took this text and because he thought it was from Jerome, he read into the patristic text something that was not there according to the original intent of the author. Because whatever Pelagius believed, he did not believe the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so, Mr. Rogers, I think this is important to take a step back and be much more careful uh, and provide some kind of analysis for the text that you're looking at for your readers and for yourself. Because, and, and I, here I'm not trying to do a one up and thing, seriously, because everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. You've seen some of my spelling mistakes. OK, I've made mistakes, so I'm, I'm not trying to cow you or humiliate you, but I see these texts float around from Jerome and others that are falsified on the Internet. And it appears 
unless you went to Petro, uh, Petrologia Latinae yourself and got this text, which is possible. I don't know if you can read Latin or not, but that's possible. Um, maybe you did, but I think it's more likely it just got ripped off the internet and got floated around and you saw it and you read it according to your presuppositions. You interpreted the data according to your presuppositions rather than providing an analysis of the text, okay? So um, this is part of the problem. And I think all the preceding material shows very clearly that you're actually reading into the text. Things that aren't exhibited, conceptual markers for sola fide aren't exhibited in the text. Now, you, again, you may have other, Mr. Rogers may have other um, texts that he can demonstrate from the fathers that teach sola fide, but none of these have. And Jerome, quote unquote, Jerome, Pelagius certainly doesn't. So moving on, um, we come to Clement, right? Clement of Rome is an early figure that Mr. Rogers uses. Um, he says, whosoever will candidly consider each particular will recognize the greatness of the gifts which were given to him or by him. For from him have sprung the priests and all the Levites who minister at the altar of God. From him also was descended our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. From him arose kings, princes, and rulers of Judah. Nor are his other tribes in small glory inasmuch as God has promised. Your seed shall be as the stars of the heaven. All these, therefore, were highly honored and made great, not for their own sake or for their own works or for the righteousness which they wrought but through the operation of his will. And we too, having been called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, nor by our own wisdom or understanding or godliness or works which we have wrought in holiness of heart, but by faith through which from the beginning, almighty God has justified all men to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. So again, get your sola fide checklist and start looking for indicators. So those are gonna, probably going to be, if you think they're anywhere, in the bottom half of the text. He says, for the righteousness, he says, not for, the, not for their own sake or for their own works, okay? For the righteousness which they wrought. Now, the question is, what does righteousness which they wrought mean? Does that mean good things they did under God's grace? in God's grace, that is with divine power, or things they did on their own, and therefore were just human righteousness. We might say a created righteousness, but the text doesn't say. But through the operation of his will. So what is the origin? What is, this is expressing a question of origination. Well, it's through the operation of God's will. God is the origin. Now, people who may be thinking, well, see, that's that's Reformation doctrine. Well, not necessarily. Augustine believes that. Ambrose believes that. Lots of fathers believe that. But that's not sufficient for sola fide. We are not justified of ourselves. All anti-Pelagians agree, nor by our own wisdom. We agree, or understanding, or godliness, or works, which we have wrought in holiness of art. Right, insincerity. Just because you're sincere and you lack grace, uh, that's not going to count for squat for God. But by faith, through which, from the beginning, God has justified all men. Now, people might see the term through and think, well, this is instrumentality. Could be instrumentality. Question is, is it faith as a condition or is it faith as an instrumental cause? Does Clement give us any analogy or explication to tell us what he has in mind? No. So based on the text, there's nothing here which we can point to that exhibits or expresses um, sola fide. Now, there's some other texts from, from Clement we're going to look at. Let us cleave then to his blessing and consider what are the means of possessing it. Let us think over the things which have taken place from the beginning. For what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Okay. Was it not because he wrought, wrought righteousness and truth through faith? 
Isaac, with perfect confidence, as if knowing what was to happen, cheerfully yielded himself a sacrifice. Jacob, that wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be happily yielding myself to sacrifice. Sorry. Uh, Jacob, through reason of his brother, went forth with humility. Notice these are virtues. Obedience, humility from his own land came to Laban and served him. And there was given to him the scepter of 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Now, I know what Mr. Rogers is going to say is that this is all um, the fruit. Abraham is justified based on the consequence of his acts. But look at the language here. What, what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he wrought righteousness and truth through faith? It seems like, it at least seems like, that there's a connection between activity and faith, human action and faith, that together, right, they account for or explain Abraham's blessing. If that's true, then what Clement has in mind is that Abraham had the conditions, right? Faith is operating as a condition. It's something pleasing God. With respect to Clement, as well as many of the other apostolic fathers, um, you have this book from, um, this is a reprint from Thomas Torrance. This is one of his early works um, where he's not quite so nice. Uh, on the doctrine of grace in the apostolic fathers and speaking of clement he says the fundamental idea at the back of the words diakosune or tikaya umai seems to be the oral qualification which avails before god conceived as a what quality of the soul so faith is a quality of the soul torrent says that is achieved by faith which is fear of god working itself out in obedience now, the interesting thing about this book by Torrance is, to, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, maybe Mr. Rogers will friendly correct me, uh, he never rescinded this work. And he goes through Ignatius, Clement, all, all the apostolic fathers pretty much, or at least Shepherd of Hermas, there's a bunch of them, Polycarp. His conclusion is that they all apostatized from the gospel of justification by faith alone uh, right after the apostles died. That's pretty much his his thesis that there's no doctrine of justification by faith alone um it's all justification by works in the fathers now i think torrance is seriously wrong there but he does do extended analysis um there has been some recent work uh attempting to overturn that which i read um which i think anybody who's read torrance's work and read this other work i forget the guys arnold arnold is the, is the author i believe i think it's like justification in the second century uh, I think if you read the two books, you'll see very clearly that Arnold does not diminish Torrance's account. Um, in any case, this is from um, an article. So we're going to switch gears here for for the remainder. We're going to start getting into Marius Victorinus. So this has two parts, and there's one other part. So I'm trying to go through this as fast as I can, and I know I'm talking really, really fast, but maybe you can slow down the speed later and watch it that way. So we come to Marius Victorinus, who was um, a Platonic philosopher uh, in Rome. He was very famous, as Mr. Rogers correctly noted. Uh, he had a bust, a statue erected in his honor. He was uh, essentially a Platonic philosopher and um he's significant because he wrote the first latin commentary on the pauline corpus or at least a significant portion of it we have galatians ephesians and philippians we we have i think the first two to three chapters of his commentary on romans um he did a commentary on paul's corinthians epistles but those are lost now i cited this from this article for two reasons look at what it says um 20th century scholarship on Victorinus has typically focused on the theological treatises and their philosophical sources. This means particularly his Trinitarian works, his anti-Arian works. Only recently has attention shifted to his com uh, to extant commentaries on Pauline epistles. So look at the date of this academic article, 2021, I believe it was April uh, when it came out. What does she say? The scholarship on Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians 
is fairly recent. Now, why am I quoting this? This is an, a warning to be cautious. What you have to understand in academia is sometimes you get into niches and there's only a handful of scholars who may work on a particular area. There aren't that many people who work on Marius Victorinus. So given the, the lack of people looking at the material and arguing and analyzing and peer reviewing each other, you got to be careful. You, this would have been a portend to Mr. Rogers had he read this article. I don't know, maybe he has read it. That, okay, this is kind of recent. Maybe I shouldn't like go gung-ho on this because maybe there's something I'm missing if I just read Cooper's commentary on Ephesians. Like the other things missing would be like, I don't know, his commentary on Ephesians and Philippians, just in terms of primary text. Not to mention what he says in the his uh, pro-Trinitarian or pro-Nicene works. So um, we're going to do some background and try to contextualize um, Mr. Uh, Victorinus, OK? Um, now here, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Here I need to do a little bit of talking without text. Um, so the, well, let me just do this first. So this is from Cooper. This is uh, in the commentary that Mr. Rogers uses, which I also have a copy of. He says, the following sketch of Marius Victor in his understanding of justification by faith demands the cautionary note that because his commentary on Romans is lost and his work on Galatians has two lengthy lacunae, we cannot arrive at a comprehensive reconstruction of his teaching on the subject of what? Justification by faith. This is Cooper. This is his own source saying this. So now this doesn't go the whole way, showing that Mr. Rogers is wrong, but Mr. Rogers uncritically makes the much stronger claim that Cooper does that he actually teaches the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone that Mars Victorinus does. But Cooper here is holding back from this. And you see this when you read the commentary, he'll say this has the ring, uh, the Reformation ring to it, or you know, he's approaching Luther's doctrine or things like this. Well, those, that's all, that's academic speak for, I'd like to say this, but I can't quite prove this yet. So Mr. Rogers make a stronger claim than his sources. And at this point, I'm going to think Cooper probably has a better idea than Mr. Rogers does about Marius Victorinus's thought and his text. Um, he's being more reserved. So maybe we might want to be a little bit reserved. Okay. Uh, he also, Mr. Rogers uses an article by Dong Sung Cho, which I've referenced there at the bottom, Justification of Marius Victorinus, Pauline Commentaries, where Cho argues that he did in fact teach Sola Fide and Sola, um, Sola Christo and Sola Dea Gloria, all those things, right? Um, now, to be honest, I read Cho's articles. I read some of his other articles as well, and I've read a bunch of the other literature on Marius Victorinus. And my impression was, and I don't mean to be crass, but that Mr. Cho took up Calvin's Institutes, grounded them into dust, and then snorted them, and then he went and read this article, or wrote this article. Because uh, we'll see later that it's just, that it's got serious academic flaws in it. But here, I want to point out, these are things that Cho himself concedes, or at least partially concedes. He says, there are three apparent differences between Victorinus and the Reformers. First, the, the former does not substantially expound the instantaneous and declarative aspects of justification. Although he uses the phrase imputed, well, we, we saw in Latin that Ambrosius used that, Ambrosiaster used that term. We've seen other people use that term. Imputed, reckoned in the Latin can also mean uh, it's imputed for righteousness, it's accepted as righteousness, because that's how, how Ambrosiaster and other authors use it. So that's kind of a weak statement by Cho. We cannot find a meaningful analogy or illustration of justification as a judicial process. So there's no judicial process in Marius Victorinus, which we could easily detect among the reformers. Second, the patristic Latin exegete does not speak of the sweet exchange between Christ and believing sinners, an analogy of imputation which is found not only in Luther, but also in the second century Christian literature Letter to Diognetus. Well, we already saw that in the letter to Diognetus, 
there's an exchange, but there's no reason to think of it in terms of forensic imputation. There's nothing in the text that requires us to read that. There's no language of you, God classed you this way, and now he's classed you another. He saw you this way, now he sees you another, that the relation is purely attitudinal. There's nothing like that in Diognetus. Third, Victorinus presents faith almost as an obligation of sinners. We'll see why that's the case. And does not hesitate to point to the uneasy, the easiness of believing, which is kind of going to run right against Luther's bondage of the will. Lessons that one will not find in Luther and Calvin. So this is mitigating material that if you just went from Mr. Rogers' video and didn't read the actual article, you would think that everything is just honky-dory with Mr. Cho. But it's not. Even Mr. Cho is guarded in this respect. Okay. Thomas Sheck, uh, who has written a book on the doctrine of justification in uh, the history of the doctrine of justification and origins commentary, which is a really good book. Um, he's also written done this translation for James, uh, Jerome's actual commentaries on Galatians, Titus, and Philemon. He states this, and he has a whole section talking about Marius Victorinus because he's dealing with Jerome. He says, moreover, even a cursory reading of Victorinus' exegesis of Paul shows that he simply does not consult the Old Testament or even the Gospels for clarification of Paul's meaning. And the reason for this, as an aside, was because he converted late in life and there are going to be some other reasons why he might not cite from the Old Testament. But we're going to be charitable and say, you know, we're going to chalk that up. He converted late in life. He was very old. He interprets Paul solely from Paul in the manner in which the Greeks explained Homer solely from Homer. A comparison to the scripture indexes of Victorinus and Jerome's commentaries reveals the real distinction between these two approaches. Victorinus's commentary does not contain a single explanatory reference to the Old Testament. That might help you understand the New Testament a little bit. Moreover, it offers very minimal, minimal consultation of the gospel traditions to shed light on Paul's teaching and intentions. The contrast with St. Jerome's teaching could not, or Jerome's exegesis could not be greater. Okay, so that's a champagne bottle. So that's my signal to switch gears here. So that's some qualifying material that's in the academic literature. There's tons more. I have 250 pages of notes. Uh, so what you're just getting here is just the bare minimum um, in terms of a case. So I kind of went a little OCD on this. Um, my wife's not real happy. Anyway, so what we need to do is we need to give some more background to Marius Victorinus because the problem that I see with Mr. Rogers and others who are picking up the commentary from Galatians, one, they're not um, reading. Um, here's Ambrosiaster's commentary, by the way. Uh, just in case, in Carlson's book. They're not reading this book, which is also translated by Cooper, um, which has a ton of information in it. Uh, and they're not reading the commentary, the commentary on Philippians either. And so they're seeing shapes in the clouds, patterns in the commentary on Galatians that really aren't there because they're not contextualizing and paying attention to what Marius Victorina said or what his conceptual world was. So in order to do that, I need to do a little kind of quick rundown on uh, Platonism because Marius Victorina was a Platonic philosopher and he didn't stop being one after he became a Christian. So the reason why this is important is anybody who's talked to cultists know. If you talk to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Witness Pentecostals, doesn't matter what it is. Okay? Um, they can use the same words you do and mean something completely different. We just saw this with Pelagius. Pelagius uses justification by faith alone, means something completely different. Whatever he means, we know he doesn't mean what the reformers mean by that phrase. So you have to look at somebody's context and how they're using terms in that context to get at the semantic content, their meaning. So this is why we need to take a romp through Platonism, okay? So um, if you're interested in background of Platonism, the Cambridge Companion to Plotinus is very good. Um, Wallace's, W-A-L-L-I-S, his book entitled Neoplatonism is really short, it's cheap, it's from Hackett, it's really good. Anything by A.C. Lloyd, by Gerson, Gersh, 
Armstrong, Blumenthal, these are all the standard scholars in uh, research on, on Platonism and, and late Platonism. Uh, Richard Kraut, uh, Gail Fine. Um, there's a number of, of uh, uh, Penner, I believe, has a, has a work on commentary on Plato's ethics. So if you're interested in reading more, those are the kind of works you would go and look through. So the figures that we're going to be looking at really briefly, and I'm going to be explaining very quickly, are people like Plotinus, Plato, uh, obviously being the source for Platonism, and Porphyry. Um, the follower of Plotinus. Uh, Plotinus has an interesting history. He studied under the Platonist philosopher Ammonius Saccus, who incidentally was also the teacher <clears throat> of origin of Alexandria. They both studied under the same Platonist. Why is this important? Because Marius Victorinus is a follower of both Plotinus and Porphyry. So it's possible that some of the more platonically colorful teachings of origin that kind of get him into trouble, they might show up in Marius Victorinus. They might explain what he means by things like liberation or faith or faith alone or justification and things like this. So we need to pay attention to this. So in Platonism, um, the idea is that there's a kind of primordial unity, a one, and there are this explains the reality of everything else. This is the source of everything. It is immaterial. It is unity. Why? Because for anything to exist, no pun intended, one thing has to be true of it. It has to be at least one thing. Unity is primary for Plato and Plotinus and Porphyry. Then comes intelligence or intellect or nous, not the thing you put around the neck but the greek term news and after that is life these are in late platonism and middle platonism the three hypostases right the three substances three things and so what you have here is a kind of cascade so you've ever been to a wedding and you've seen these kind of really grand champagne um deals and these things will like go up to the roof, right? They'll be like super tall and they'll pour in some champagne here. They don't show it here and it'll pour into the other, into the other, into the other, into the other and so forth. This is a good analogy for how Platonists are thinking of reality. Everything begins with an Im Im immaterial unity and it's completely potent. It has all power. But as you go down to that next level of causal power, that next level is diminished. So you go from something that's all cause and no effect to something that's partially a cause and partially an effect. So there's a cascade of power, there's a cascade of being, and it goes from the most potent to the least potent or impotent. So there's a diminishment. And then, so we need to talk about what these things are, some of these things that are coming out from the one. This is Plato's doctrine of the forms, or eidos is the Greek term. What are forms for Plato? Well, forms are not these abstract, causally inert things for Plato. This is a mythology, so you'll hear this sometimes in college classes and undergraduate. It's completely wrong. Uh, Plato's very clear in the Republic. He says explicitly, the forms are the causes of things. So forms are immaterial powers that cause in their effects, they extend themselves into the world. So for, the, for things that are tall, the form of tall has extended itself. For things that are cold, the cold has extended itself to produce coldness. So I'm using the language of extension here to give you the idea that these are not cut off copies of things. They are extensions of power, right? Now, what happens? So you have this kind of pyramid structure here that you see with the champagne glasses. That's exactly how the Platonists think of reality in terms of a great chain of being, which was a very popular book on the subject by uh, Lovejoy called The Great Chain of Being. And so we keep going and go from cause to effect, cause to effect, cause to effect, and the causes get weaker and weaker and weaker to the bottom till you get something that has no causal power at all. It's all the causal residue. It's the leftover. 
That is what the Platonists think of matter. Right? Matter is always many and never one. It has no unity. It has no causal power of its own. It can't explain anything. So to distinguish between a Platonist conception of matter, and this will be very important for understanding Marius Victorinus, um, and uh, to distinguish his conception and our conception, modern people think of matter as having a quality of its own, extension. It takes up space. It has weight. It has mass. It has these own inherent properties, right? That's how moderns think of it. Plato and the Platonists and the Aristotelians, they don't think of matter that way. They think of matter as having no quality. Quality are forms, roughly speaking, that come to matter, exert their power on matter to create or bring about objects or a body. So body and matter are not the same for Platonists. Body is what you get when, or an object is what you get when forms exert themselves on the material world or on matter to create objects in the world. So for Plato and for the Platonists, soul creates the human body. It acts on matter. So Platonists don't talk so much about the soul being in the body. It's the other way around. Body is in the soul. The soul is, soul just means life. It's the power of life that brings about, uh, it forms matter. It brings about an object, okay? So that's what soma is, is body. And now we need to talk a little bit about soul and souls. So I remember I told you that the third thing that the one produces is in that hierarchy is soul, okay? This is a world soul. This is the thing that accounts for life of any, any individual object that's living. Plant is vegetative soul, to use their Aristotelian designations. Uh, animal, animale, uh, literally in the Greek, the, the running things, the things that move. Um, it's kind of funny in the primitive Greek, but um, that's animal soul. That's a higher or more intense degree of, of being. Why? Because it can move and plants can't. Then we get to intellect or reason or mind, right? And so the idea that Plato and Platonism has is that Individual souls are just an extension of world or cosmic soul. So then we have uh, just a few more items here to get right into Marius Victorinus. So then we have the doctrine in late Platonism of so the fall of soul into body. And so the idea is there are obviously living things here. So life or soul is manifesting itself here. How did that happen? Because life is more perfect than body. And it's certainly more perfect than matter, which is completely imperfect in this schema. So they have to explain how life or soul exists here. And so there's a fall of soul into body. And this is discussed in Plotinus' Aeneid um, 4, I think section 8. And what's interesting there. Um, for our Reformed friends, is that um, the arguments that Plotinus gives and the view that he expresses is that is that individual souls, as the production of this world soul, were enamored or allured or lured by this curious thing below them called matter. They get distracted by it. And so they go and they try and check it out. And of course, like all good horror movies, when you try to check out the monster, it right, it gets you. And so this is the platonic idea. Out of this kind of vain curiosity, which has parallels to Gnosticism, um, soul falls into body. And that's how you get um, embodied beings or embodied soul. Now, why did I say this is interesting for our Reformed friends? Because Plotinus in Aeneid 4 talks about this fall being both necessary and also being free. It's determined, but necessary. Why is it determined? Because the causal power of soul can't stop. It just naturally emanates itself. So the fall is necessary, but he uses stoic arguments to argue, well, it's necessary, but it's also free. And he gives classically all the same, pretty much philosophical arguments that the reformed give for their form of determinism. 
Little did they know that Plotinus was a Calvinist. Not really. In any case, souls become encrusted in matter. Because matter clouds reason or intellect, they are deceived by things in the world. They're held captive in matter. And this requires a messenger, right? Some mechanism or somebody sent to come liberate them. The classic example of this in Platonism is Socrates. If you read Plato's works, um, Socrates says that he's a diviner, that he has a divine commission from his daemon. Daemon and demon are not the same thing in antiquity. Daemon is a guiding spirit. So he has a divine commissioning in the Platonic corpus. And then he commissions Plato. So you have this kind of philosophical apostolic succession, so to speak, from Plato, from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle. And then on to Plotinus, you know, Monius Saccus, and then to Plotinus and Porphyry and Proclus and so on and so forth. So there's a messenger or there's some way in which these trapped souls can liber become liberated. So you have the way down, you've reached rock bottom. Now we have to talk about the way back up. And that's why the messenger or at least the mechanism for recollecting or recollecting um, is important. So the word for recollection in Greek, you might be familiar with in the New Testament, uh, from the New Testament but much earlier, is metanoia, which in New Testament Greek is for repentance. But in classical Greek, in Plato, it means to recollect or recollect. And so in Plato's allegory of the cave, which I'm sure you all know, um, there's a guy who finds himself chained. He can't look at himself, so he can't know himself. All he can see are shadows on the wall. Eventually he gets free. He can turn around and see that the shadows are being projected by other people. What he's thought his whole life is real is not. He starts working up the cave till he can get outside. Eventually his eyes adjust and he can see the sun and he can see the way things really are. He comes back down to try and tell all those poor saps down there that they're things that they think are real really aren't. They think he's crazy and they kill him. The man in the cave is obviously Socrates because he gets killed for telling people the truth, the way things really are. The problem is that um, the for, um, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. So anyway, for metanoia, ah, so the way that Plato understands metanoia is literally says this in the Republic to turn the soul around. So you can turn around and see the way things really are. So you can understand why a Platonist who would start hearing Christians talk about metanoia, that might pique their interest a little bit. Um, and further, in the Plato's dialogue of Phaedo, he gives this long discourse about the soul, and he's asked, well, Socrates, can we know that this is true? And Socrates says, not unless somebody comes back from the dead and tells us. So you have Christians who are talking about repentance or metanoia or turning the soul around, reorienting it, and they got somebody who came back from the dead that told them about this. That's totally going to get a Platonist interest right there. So what does the soul do? The soul stops thinking that matter is, is fundamental reality. That's what the shadows on the wall are. They're material objects. And starts recollecting in itself to itself by reason to what is ultimate, true, which is immaterial. That's because the soul is immaterial. It's recollecting or returning to itself. So the intellect, the news, is the point of contact between this realm and the immaterial world of the forms and the one. And so matter then is to be eschewed, to be rejected. And liberation is liberation from the material body. It's an ascent back to unity, which is why for Plotinus and Porphyry, they spent some time discussing the problem of suicide, like if you're trapped in a body, like why not just off yourself and go back up to the one? That's why that's a philosophical problem for them. Um, some other things to note, and then we'll get right back into Marius Victorinus, is that um, the Platonic philosophers had an ethical critique of popular religion. According to Plato's Republic, following rules and rituals can't make you just. Virtue can't be taught. Because you can produce a rule and unjust people can follow it. And um, 
as Plato says in the Republic, people who think that justice comes from following rules are like the guy who fights the Hydra. You cut one head off and two more grow back, meaning you try and make people just by following a rule. What do they do? They find a way around the rule. So now you have to create more rules and so on and so forth. So justice cannot be had for in for the Platonists with respect to popular religion by going and offering sacrifice to Zeus. It's nice. It's symbolic. Um, but that's not going to help you. That's not what true justice is, or you can't you can't get it that way. This is why Plotinus famously, when he was invited to go to one of the pagan festivals to honor the gods, he said, it is not for me to go to them. It is for them to come to me, meaning I'm ascending back up to the one. I don't need them. And this ethical critique was also found in um, Porphyry uh, and others, though there was in later Platonism a development of Platonic rituals called theurgy. Uh, where they incorporated the philosophy uh, with these kind of rituals, and some of them copying Christianity to an extent. Take that, all you atheist uh, dependence theorists. Uh, also, what's important to note is the Platonists inherited Roman anti-Semitic uh, attitudes. So um, there were a number of Judaizing sects in Rome, which is partly what Ambrose Yaster and part, partly what we'll see uh, Marius Victorinus is actually reacting to in part, but Romans had a negative view of, of Judaism, uh, not least of which was because of the rebellion, but also for other things they thought they were uh, like, like quaint or strange. You only have one God, that's kind of strange, and you limit sex to your wife. Um, for the Romans, that's just nuts. Uh, and you think the world is created from nothing. That's like super nuts for the pagan Romans. So especially for Platonists as well. So they are, um, they don't have a high opinion of Jews in, in Italy and particularly in Rome. So now, because you're done looking at the champagne, we'll move on to uh, Judaizers at Rome. So again, this is Cooper. This is uh, material from the commentary on Galatians that Mr. Rogers should have read or at least did read, said this aspect of Victorinus's Paulinism, following Paul, could be more accentuated in order to demonstrate to the educated pagans of Rome, precisely by way of Paul, that one can be a Christian and a Platonist at the same time without any Jewish mediation. Mara, that's a particular scholar, suggestion has plausibility in light of some anti-Jewish strands of Roman culture, which as a whole was not uniformly hostile to Jews or Judaism, yet because of the negative views find a prominent place in Latin authors. Cicero, Horace, Tacitus, Juvenal, and Marshall. Victorinus and other educated pagans may well have absorbed aspects of this anti-Judaism prior to any contact, contact with specifically Christian variety of it. And he talks about this quite a bit. I'm just giving you a taste here. So here's the question. Given that background in Platonism and what I told you, what Platonism essentially taught, I just saved you a semester of philosophy, by the way. Uh, is Marius Victorinus a Platonizing Christian or a Christianizing Platonist? That's a good question. Now, I do think he was a sincere Christian, but I think Augustine was a sincere Christian in the Confessions, too. And Augustine has all kinds of unchristian ideas in the Confessions. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, the quote here, in a period when it was unexceptional for Christian authors to interpret the central tenets of their religion, with Greek philosophical thought and terminology, Gaius Maris Victorinus stands as an exceptional figure in fourth century Latin church. In the level of philosophical discourse, he brought to the doctrinal problems of his newly adopted religion. So he has a strong philosophical, Greek philosophical background. After his conversion, again, this is Cooper. This is in his article, The Platonist Christianity of Marius Victorinus, which is a great article. After his conversion, Marius Victorinus entered the fray from the fourth century Trinitarian conflict by composing dense theological treatises and hymns, which he did by bristling with formidable Platonist vocabulary and thought. The series of commentaries Victorinus composed on Paul's epistles also reveal his philosophical predilections and digression of the realities of God and the soul uh, intimated by the apostle. 
These works makes Marius, Marius Victorinus the premier Latin exemplar of the, quote, remarkable synthesis of Christianity and Platonism, thus Crusell that came to a fruition in Augustine and Boethius. So what is Victorinus doing? He's synthesizing Christianity and Platonism. We haven't seen to the degree to which he does that, whether it's more Platonism and less Christianity or vice versa. But we do know that that's what he's doing, according to Cooper. The generally Neoplatonic or Platonist character of the thought in Victorinus has long been recognized, and Plotinus was held to be his main philosophical source. Again, Cooper, same scholar that Mr. Rogers relies on in the commentary on Galatians. It is generally acknowledged that the, that the impact of philosophical thought in Victorinus's Christian works make, makes itself particularly felt on the one hand in a doctrinal and anti-heretical thrust. This is his doctrine of God. And then on the other hand, where does the Platonism show up? His soteriology, chiefly his teachings on the soul. Oh, look at this from Marius Victorinus in his work against Arius. Certainly, by the breath of God, we have a soul, okay? And from that, there is a part in us which is supreme in us. So we have this platonic idea that there's a higher part and a lower. Therefore, we touch him, referencing God, by that point where we are from him and dependent on him. Wait, 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 you have a part that's from him, from God? Well, for a Platonist, what does he probably mean? That you're an extension of God in some way, of God's being in some way. So here we have the beginnings talking about his view of the preexistence of the soul. The divine soul is the representative of the higher realm as a descendant of world soul. Remember I talk about that global soul, universal soul, which Victorinus as a Christian theologian put outside the divine proper. So it's lower down, just as I said. Again, Cooper. Victorinus followed the platonic doctrine of world soul to the point of including soul on an ontological level or intelligible realities located just below the level of the divine proper. This clearly undescended soul is described by Victorinus as life-giving power possessed to be possessed of its own to be to live to know everything comes in threes it's triadic in platonic philosophy it enacts on a lower level of being so you have the higher level of universal soul and then a lower manifestation what the more divine life of noose does on the higher just as the more divine unitary trinity made by its radiance, and the ellipses there are from the author, they're not from me. Uh, the soul to be subsisting reality, its own proper substance in the intelligible world. So too the soul, a second unitary trinity, what has unfurled its image-making power. So it produces these effects, which are extensions of itself. In the sensory world, that means here, the same soul which always existing above gives birth to worldly souls. So you can see how why the Gnostics would be under this, right? One thing gives birth out of anxiety to another. That this is indeed the world soul is evident by this by the distinction Victorinus makes between, quote, soul always existing above, unquote, and the worldly souls, unquote, that have lost the heavenly seat. Just as on the level of the divine power, the son is the image of the father. We have this cascade and his life so too outside the divine, figuratively speaking, as Victorinus does not think these realities are in space, they're immaterial, comes soul, quote, created as an image of life and the life of the divine mind. Speaking of the general academic consensus, uh, re the received view about Victorinus, which this author will critique a little bit in this article, he says, Victorinus agrees with Plotinus and other Platonists and other Neoplatonists, that this human soul, which is the essence of man, existed before its combination with a body, before it was incarcerated in matter. So there we have, we have the beginnings of the incarceration of matter. Again, Cooper, in this article on uh, philosophical exegesis in Marius Victorinus. Victorinus's digression at Ephesians 1, this commentary, Concerning the soul's pre-existence is perhaps the most obvious imposition of Platonism. 
So it's obvious. More precisely of the Plat Platonist Seelen metaphysic, gotta love those German words, that is the metaphysics of soul. In his exposition of the Pauline text, it is certainly the most problematic from the standpoint of orthodoxy that congealed on this point through the originist controversy. Oh, so origin had the same problem with pre-existence of soul and they both have a common source in Plotinus and may well have made his commentaries difficult for latter authors to use or mention. That might explain why people didn't use his commentaries later, not because he was preaching Protestantism, but because he was preaching Platonism. Victorinus's line here has a distinct line of connection to the views articulated by Plotinus and Porphyry on the challenges facing embodied souls. Victorinus, Victorinus deduces the soul's pre-existence from the phrase of Ephesians 1.4, that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So Victorinus thinks that phrase implies that souls pre-exist their bodies, okay? And then he goes on to pose questions that recall some of the problems that Origen had attempted to resolve on first principles against the Valentinians, that's a Gnostic sect, and other dualist Christians. That's code for Gnostic heretics. Thus, Victorinus, quote, if we were in Christ and were spiritual beings, we existed, as Paul has subsequently asked before the foundation of the world, what sort of cause would bring us to come here? Right? There's that question. We got to explain how soul gets down here. Why would the world be founded if Christ himself made all things in eternity and in the world through the will of God? All things were in him and they necessarily existed substantially. They're not an idea God's thinking about. They're things. And again, the ellipses there are from Cooper. They're not me. Therefore, all things existed in Christ. But why has the world been founded? And why did many things come here into the world? Unquote from Victorinus. Victorinus laid out his ontological scheme of reality most fully in this anti-Aryan work. But he did second response to Candidia certain contained additional illuminating imagery. After quoting Colossians 2.19 with its mentions of the whole body to solve the question of what are all the things that are from Christ and God, Victorinus repels any thought that the, quote, body of the whole universe, I think you're thinking like you just stepped into an episode of Stranger Things or something, the body of the whole universe is like a pile of things united only by physical contiguity. So he rejects a crass atomism. Rather, the whole universe is a self-contained body like a chain, remember the great chain of being, in which all parts are interlinked. Quote, for there is a chain, Victorinus says, God, Jesus, the spirit, new soul, angels, from all, and from there, all corporeal body thing beings. This is the great chain of being made famous by Arthur Lovejoy, 1936 title, and Victorinus's use of the imagery of a chain is the earliest extant philosophical employment of the terminology witnessed later in Macrobius, it's another philosopher, uh, another figure, excuse me and probably deriving from Porphyry's commentary on the Chaldean oracles. A similar idea occurs in Plotinus's treatise entitled On the Origin and Order of Beings, which come after the first. Plotinus imagines the whole not as a chain, but with another image of extension, even though he explicitly denies that soul, like intellect, is, quote, in a plate or in place. Quote, it is then like a life, a long life, stretched out at length. There's that extension. Each part is different from that which comes next in order. We have that diminishment. But the whole is continuous with itself. Any such hierarchical image implying descending ontological levels in the divine is theologically incorrect for a Nicene Christian. Victorinus's list has Jesus notched below God and followed by the spirit and noose, but he ignores the subordinationalist implication. Below noose is Victorinus' chain comes soul and angels and in that order the soul is the third principle in adherence to the platonic doctrine after angels come corporeal om omnia that is all embodied beings anything that has or is a body victorinus begin or begins his ontological account in ad candidium seven by mentioning realities that belong to the divine being essay there are, quote, things which really exist, which he refers to as a class of intellectabilia or noble realities that comprise a triple realm. Again, three is the number and the number is three, as Monty Python says. Again, this is from Cooper, his article, The Platonist Christianity and Marius Victorinus. Next, 
The lengthiest of Victorine's philosophical discussions in his commentaries on Paul occurs in the treatment of Ephesians 1.4. The occasion for the digression is the assertion of verse 4, that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy. The most obvious Platonist aspect of Victorinus's discussion is his assertion that souls exist prior to embodiment. Plato asserted this in a number of dialogues, in the Phaedo, the Phaedrus, so on and so forth. And Plotinus developed these suggestions at length in his treatise on the descent of souls into bodies, as I said in the Ephori. Victorinus seems to have felt there was nothing inherent in Christianity that prevented an importation of Platonic teachings on the soul. Now, if you remember Mr. Rogers' presentation, language of soul comes up quite a bit. So... When you see Victorinus talk about soul in, in Mr. Rogers' videos, you have to understand it this way. He's importing platonic content into a Christian framework or appearance. The false soul. He, Victorinus, regards this idea of pre-existence of soul as the logical pendant to the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. He really thinks there was a fall of soul. In contrast to St. Paul, because, you know, he's just teaching whatever Paul says, right? Victorinus considers this fall to be a cosmic event and was not the consequence of a prideful or misdirected use by man of his freedom. Remember I said it was necessary, right? So that eschews the Christian answer. Well, why is the world the way it is? Well, because people misuse their free will. That's not Victorinus's view. Then we have the allure of matter. The human soul is located midway between the intelligible world, that's the immaterial world of forms, and the world of matter, hule, that's the Greek term. It is created as an image of the eternal image, participating in the logos and in nous. But what it inclines to the mortal, notice, remember I said it gets attracted to stuff down below. It turns away from the life in which it has been. Here, Victorinus' psychology is proximate to that of Plotinus. So this is from uh, Gerald Bursma. This is actually a book on Augustine, but he has a whole really good chapter on um, Victorinus. All right. Victorinus' account of the twofold soul, heavenly and material, is intelligible in light of Plotinus' psychology. Victorinus writes, it is not news, but when it looks towards the news, that is the cosmic intellect, it is as if it were news. So you become like what you contemplate or think on. For there Vision is union. So how do you think he's going to think of faith? Faith is an attitude towards God. Union. It is the nature of soul as secundum imagium to move by retaining the vision of the logos back to that of which it is an image by participation. Victorinus underscores the tenuous nature of participatory existence for a created image. When the soul turns away from this vision, vision in which it is union, it becomes like that in which it desires, temporal and intellectual. It descends towards the material. That's from Burzma. This will now we're back to Cooper again. The individuation of worldly souls from soul puts them in a different place, or rather in a place at all, because they are immaterial, so then they become located in space. Just as soul imitates intellect, so too souls get carried away from the power, by the power of life in them. They get carried away, curious. The images, the great life above, tilting downward and away from intellect noose, soul drags itself and its intellect downwards. Again, these ellipses are by the author, not me. If it fixes its gaze on inferiors because it is wanton, it becomes a life-giving power which makes the world and things in the world to live soul life even a stone in the matter of stones so even soul even stones have a degree of life this kind of panpsychism everything is living this attention to the lower results in the soul becoming shadowy and it is let downward right whence embodied souls com uh, composite entities this fall from heavenly realm occurs with obvious parallel in origin and plotinus through the soul's freedom Notwithstanding its deprivation of the true life, the soul can be called to higher realms on account of the faint spark of its own news. Noose. Yeah, the idea of a cosmic spark in every being. Yeah. Um, this is the doctrine informing Victorinus's notion of soul as being capable of spiritual transformation. Now, you think this is going to inform his understanding of what faith is? 
It's not going to be from Paul. It's going to be from Plotinus. So when he talks about faith alone and the soul's orientation to God, he's using Pauline language, but he doesn't necessarily have a Pauline idea. Captivity of the soul in his work against Arius, human souls, uh, excuse me, should say remain human souls, uh, have been taken captive in embodiment in its tempta temptations. Together with the Holy Spirit, the Logos frees the souls. Remember I said divine messenger? And with an eschatological element, releases them from particularity. So what is the problem? The problem is that we're like matter. We're all spread out. We have to all be united back to the one. Leads them back to perfect spirituality and universality. This is from Hellman's article, which again just came out in 2021 in April. This is important because it is almost automatically leads this captivity of the soul, Vanderjot says, to having to call matter as opposed to will, if not evil in itself, at least the principle of evil. This cosmic fall condemns man to live in a body, which is the source of human error and vice. So you can see very clearly why Platonists, uh, in some respects, was very close to Gnosticism at this time. The difference is going to be the Platonists think that the material world is still good, it's just less good. And the Gnostics think the material world is completely just not good in any sense at all. The participatory ontology, this is from Burzma again, that undergirds Victorinus's understanding of the human soul suggests the influence of Plotinus's anthropology. Again, all these different scholars keep saying the same thing. And there's like another dozen or so scholars I've got on this. The human person comprises a body made of four elements symbolized by the dust of the earth and a twofold soul. So in late Platonism, things start getting multiplied beyond necessity. The material soul, and this is not a soul made up of matter. This is soul that governs material things, is shared with all living creatures that have breath of life. The heavenly soul, which is rational, reason, is reserved for the human person, since God breathed his own life into the face of Adam. Victorina sees these two souls, or logi, that is principles, in the human person suggested in the gospel passage. Now watch how he interprets the gospel. Of the two men working in the field and the two women grinding at the meal, at the mill. Well, you guys know that story. Does that have to do with two souls, a material soul and a heavenly soul? Likewise, Victorinus equates the apostle Paul's inner man with the immaterial or divine soul and contrasts it with the material soul as the outer man. Is that really what Paul means? I don't think so. Matter, lay alone, puts under the category of things which are not. Remember I said matter is all effect and no cause? It is sterile. It's unproductive. Without the power of soul, alone it is indeterminate, has no qualities, as it is nothing but the substrate underlying of its qualities, which bestow determinate and upon mat the matter. Only when this qualify, only thus qualified is clause anything, fire, water, earth, so on and so forth. When soul is mixed with hule, or huli, it is among the things which are not true being. So your body is a human being that's not truly you. Yet Victorinus says both soul and body are uh, omnium nutrix, the nurse of all things, with a clear allusion to Plato's famous description in Timaeus 49a of the place of creation, which later Platonists identified with unformed matter the as the receptacle of all generation, like a nurse. So this is what he's thinking is the mature world is kind of like a training ground for soul. Soul and matter have in common the fact that they are necessary components of composite beings and take the qualities of what they are mixed with, as embodied intellectulia. Intellectulia. <laughs> Human souls have sense perception. This cognitive power has dual capacity. The material noose operates by means of sense perception in its imitation of intellectual activity. Sense perception is actually a copy of intellect, but sense perception is capable of transformation when it fully grasps the activity of intellect. It becomes similar and akin to pure intellect, the sort that comprehends the heavenly body. So we return up. The ethereal realm and things born and reborn in nature and matter. We are retracting the complex of issues, Victor, uh, retracing, excuse me, complex of issues Victorinus raised in the opening of Andi, uh, Ad Candidium and his commentary on Cicero, how the original nature, um, excuse me, that's a mistake on my mark, can be recovered from difficulties besetting embodied souls. Left to its own devices, sense perception grasps nothing but qualities. 
So it's not, doesn't get anything that's real. Neither perceiving nor comprehending the underlying thing that is substance. So again, matter is, un, is bad. Victorinus appears to have incorporated into his Christian soteriology, his doctrine of salvation, the idea of nous patricos. From where? Paul? No, the Chaldean oracles, probably through Porphyry's commentary the same. Fragment 109 of the oracles and Middle Platonist work open to such revelations as the gods gifted to barbarian people is particularly relevant. Quote, but the paternal intellect does not receive the will of the soul until it emerges from forgetfulness. It's fallen into matter. It forgets its origin. It has to recollect to metanoia, turn back to its source. And speaks a word remembering the pure paternal token. Victorinus invokes it to explain how the soul can move toward its origin, despite the difficulties attending its body existence. Again, oh, I got double reference there. It's from Cooper. The only shadow cast over this rosy light of this picture comes from the Platonist anthropology that Victorinus lays out in his preference to his work on Cicero's rhetoric. The soul descends from divine realities. Victorinus admonishes students of rhetoric, but the acuity of even perfect soul is entangled and mired in a thick coat of the body. That's matter. And it results in the soul acquiring certain forgetfulness of itself. Again, Cooper. This last note among the soul's forgetfulness of itself corresponds to the forgetfulness of the Phaedrus, which Plato says is the cause of the soul's heaviness and loss of its wings. Victorinus then relates how it is through the effort and training, so moral teaching, disciplinia, that soul is able to begin a process of recovery whereby it is uncovered, stripped, that is, escape from the body. Only then, he says, that might be liberation, you think, only then, he says, does the condition of the mind get returned and recalled away, uh, called to the way of its own nature, unquote. Victorinus goes to claim that Plato mentions various ways in soul's original excellence, virtus or virtue, can emerge, sometimes by skilled knowledge, RIT, or because it is innate and sometimes developed by exercise, that is practice, or watch this, given by God. So when Marius Victorinus is reading Paul and he's talking about these things being given by God, what do you think he's thinking? This is how you get virtue. Victorinus returns to this in commenting on Cicero's text, reminding readers again that there was once a, quote, better nature in human beings, but weighed down by the weakness of the body. It, de it declined into evil. But although the soul is capable of functioning in line with reason, the understanding can still be mistaken. Unless it also knows that which imitates it, but it is not reason. Well, that which imitates it is matter. But if the soul, I maintain, would become aware of the thing that causes mistakes, matter, what lies and deceives, matter lies, the world, material world isn't fundamentally the way it is. It's like a material matrix and would recognize, repudiate itself, and will return its power, retain its power. The soul will be complete, perfect in Christ. That is, it will be spiritual. Now, do you think Victorinus means spiritual? What St. Paul meant by spiritual? I don't. Cooper comments, what is the great deceiver that creates a likeness of understanding? He continues, but what, quote, quoting Victorinus, what the Greeks call hule, the basic motifs are boilerplate Platonism, porphyry, that is common Platonism, wrote a treatise on knowing yourself, fragments of which survive in Stabaeus, and comparable to other articulations of dangerous besetting embodied souls along the lines of Plato's discussion of the creation of souls by lesser deities in the Timaeus. So this is also from Cooper's uh, article on philosophical exegesis in uh, Marius Victorinus. Victorinus conceives the soul's dwelling in the body as a necessary path to its actualization, its con its, to the actualization, its creaturely capacities. This is very close to Plotinus in Aeneid, surprising, 8.5. However, worldly souls must meet the challenges that face them as composite entities. They're stuck in bodies. Quote, although in accordance with its intellect, the soul is, pow is a powerful being, the intellect can nonetheless be mistaken. Why? Because matter misleads it. Unless it knows that that which imitates it, 
uh, but is not in fact intellect. If I say the soul should become aware of what causes mistakes, what lies and deceives, and should recognize and repudiate and flee it as if it were an enemy or a deceiver. So you got to flee matter. The soul will easily keep itself together and recognize its own excellence if you flee matter. The soul will be full and perfected in Christ, mm. meaning it will be spiritual. But what is the imitator of understanding? The image of noose that is present in embodied soul that so deceives souls. As in the passage from, uh, from against Candidian, Discussed above, the problem is the unreliability of sense perception as a power geared toward knowing inherently unstable material reality. Matter has no structure. As, Pla as Platonist, excuse me, an old Platonist saw if ever, meaning this is something Platonists always talk about. But what sort of thing that creates a likeness of the faculty of understanding and deceives sense perception? which only exist in things of the world and what the Greeks call only matter. For through the fleshly apertures, the powers of perceptual activity, a kind of false intellect is born. With many a trick, it deceives the true faculty of understanding. So think about this. Might Marius Victorinus have a problem thinking that things you do with your body would help you ascend back to the one, like bodily acts, like giving things to the poor? You might have a problem thinking that. Therefore, the soul is by nature so disposed to be capable of understanding, the faculty of understanding could nonetheless easily slip and fall into a nearby power and then into an image of understanding, into sense perception, which is the world and is altogether from nature. Again, from Cooper. To be sure, Vanderjot says, the body does not impose total depravity. Oh, bad news for Calvinists. On the human soul, or extinguish the soul's built-in desire, notice this, the soul has a built-in desire to return to God. The return is automatic, right? Or at least has a degree of automation to it. But the body does not con constitute, uh, but the body does constitute people's problems. So what's your body? I mean, what's your problem that you need saving from? Sin? Or is it your body? I'm kind of going to make the resurrection of the body matter difficult now repentance cooper citing victorinus quote although the souls and other powers of this sort as i as i said have been established in christ this state is a lesser kind of perfection unless souls should know by experience all things capable of existing would come to recognize in this way what it is what is to be pursued so souls come to earth and embody um in this fall to be trained would see what it is to be chosen and would follow in the spirit that it is in, indeed Christ if the soul comports itself in a wholesome manner. Again, the ellipses are Cooper, they're not me. And, perfe and perfectly in all manners, that is, if it has recognized itself. So, recollection, turn to yourself. Look back to your source, known to God, and thus learns about things which are alien to it. So to repudiate and exclude them, Meaning, by doing that, you figure out that you're really not your body. The soul, quite rightly, becomes perfect. How do you become perfect from Marius Victorinus? Through this platonic intellection. Cooper continues, by means of this digression, Victorinus outlines the soul's position in the world with an emphasis upon the necessity of finding their way back from the world and to Christ and God. It is the na nature of souls to be able by this process of recognition, it's intellectual, of God and repudiation of what is alien, matter, to become perfecta, whole, integral, even while in the body, unless I misread Victorinus here, Cooper says, that human beings are capable of fall, recovery, and ontological promotion is a notion that Victorinus develops more fully in Ephesians 1.8. So he's developing this in his commentary on Ephesians. Although the idea of soul's progress in the body by means of philosophy and telesthetic, telestic, that's um, kind of esoteric practices, was standard motif of Platonism from at least Iamblichus onward. Victorinus integrates it into Pauline language and conceptually conceptuality by maintaining. So he's taking Platonic ideas and stuffing them in Paul. That it is according to the riches of God's grace. Is that what Paul means? That souls, unlike angels and daemons, which remain in their own condition, exist in such a manner as to be able by the power of God to advance into a better substance and become spirits. The use of Seelen metaphysic, that German word again, 
metaphysics of the soul as a platform for the moral teachings is a key piece of philosophical anthropology common to learn pagans and Christians. Okay, so the idea is you use this teaching about the soul to teach ethics. The integration of Platonist ideas and motifs in, into the Pauline text. This is Cooper. Um, however, is achieved largely thanks. How is it? How does he get that Platonic content in there? To aspects of Paul's vocabulary specifically Paul's use of pneuma and its cognates, spiritus, spiritalis, spiritaliter in Latin. So Cooper here is talking about that Mars Victorinus isn't using Paul's vocabulary to express platonic teaching. He's not exegeting Paul, he's eisegeting Paul. The soul will be perfect when everything, Victorine says, alien, that's matter, been repudiated. When God is recognized and when the soul has received the full knowledge of the whole, the one, the soul therefore is made spiritual. Thus also the human person and everything the person is. Victorinus, uh, Cooper says, maintain that Christ redeeming us from death refers to his redeeming us from what? From sin? from fleshly thoughts and desires. Now, what do you think Victorinus means by fleshly thoughts and desires? I don't think he means what Paul means. Having accomplished this, Christ made, quote, us to serve him, meaning to live now spiritually. This implies that we, quote, do nothing in a fleshly manner. So we don't, we're, we're not doing things according to the body's needs or desires. And think of nothing by means of what? Sense perception. Rather, he continues, totally turn to God. We tread down all earthly beings, all earthly things, and return to our origin. This is what it means to be redeemed, to be freed from captivity. What? Captivity of the body. Intellectual recollection and ascending return. Bursmo summarizes the view of Kolish account from 1991. So this has been in the literature for 30 years. This supposed integration of the body further entails that Victorinus maintains that only faith is salvific, huh? Because it is by nature spiritual. So faith is salvific for Victorinus because it's not an act of the body. It's an act of the intellect. And as immaterial aspect of the human soul inclines upwards, works, on the other hand, are grounded in the material, the very locus of the human problematic and pull the soul down. So here we need to take a minute. What is going on here? The anti-Pelagian dialectic is between, um, or let me back up. Sola fide dialectic is between divine activity and human activity. They're seen as being competitive, which is why you can't participate in God's justice. All right, for justification. The dialectic of Victorinus here for between faith and works is not that dialectic. It's not that opposition. It's a dialectic not of this, of going this way, but of this, of the immaterial versus the material. So when he's talking by faith, salvation by faith alone, he's not talking about what the reformers are talking about in terms of some conduit and some created merit that gets imputed to you forensically. He's talking about there's an act of the intellect that unites you, that puts you back on the path to your immaterial home. Okay, Serge has recently drawn attention, that's another scholar, to a particular phrase of this passage. As if some transport of the mind uh, of the soul longs, right? as key to Victorinus's treatments of the topos from the Timaeus and the difficulty of knowing God, which is surmounted by the gift of the spirit, the revelation of faith. The opening of, an, of Ancadidium shows Victorinus integrating, integrating philosophical thought with that of Christianity by coordinating seed sowing of the paternal intellect, that's the one, his intellect, noose, with the Holy Spirit. You really think that's what scripture means when it talks about the Holy Spirit? As activator of souls, in stirring them 
towards higher realities. So Victor Hayes thinks of the Holy Spirit as getting your attention to start thinking about um, immaterial things so that you can get your butt back up to heaven. And not the Christian heaven. Virtue consisting in the habitus animi, which is need, which is needful, is application and teaching, by which the mind's mode of being thus translate habitus here. This is Cooper, is returned and recollected to the mode of its own nature. The process takes place through what? Virtus, virtue. Is faith a virtue? And by birth, in this case of some developed by practice or given by God, victoriness would seem to differ with Plato by stating that an art only transmits precepts. Art doesn't mean painting. It means skill. Not what is to be done according to those precepts. So here's the issue. Plato doesn't think that um, any skill can do anything in terms of giving you virtue. Right? Thus, no art or no skill of wisdom can be taught. Virtue can't be taught. Insofar as wisdom qua virtue is always perfect and consists of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. This is a Cooper again. Like earlier Christian converts from the educated elite, um, one thinks of Valentinius, there should be one, thinks of Valentinius, Justin Clement of Alexandria. Victorinus seems to have been conceived of Christianity as a discipline, right? A discipline, a way of teaching along the lines of Platonist schools. Why? Because he was a Platonist philosopher, which had from the mid third century AD, thank you for the AD, been gaining more and more of a religious aura. So you can't think of the philosophy at the time as something not religious. We tend to think of that in America or other places as these being, well, philosophy is just thinking about stuff and religion is doing rituals and things like that. That's not how they're thinking of it. Victorinus' division of the disciplinia, uh, disciplina of Christianity according to a schema borrowed from the philosophical schools is not an idle taxonomy, but a resource that he invokes to insist on practice of religion that flows integrally from the cognito, the mind, that constitutes the beginning point of faith. So you learn these things and it brings about faith, right? Philosophical instruction does this. Now we have, he has a, there's a whole bunch of texts on this that I didn't have time to put in, uh, particularly in the commentary in Ephesians. Um, when he talks about the resurrection of the body, he talks about it in terms of a spiritual body. Um, he doesn't mean uh, a body which a physical body which is made immortal he means a spiritual mode of existence an immaterial mode of existence so notable notice this is the threefold structure of the drama of the soul from existence before the world to the worldly existence to a freeing from the world victorinus's formulation of the final goal of the soul's life as a participation in the quote glory of god combines the christian image of believers hoping to behold the glory of god now, if, it's, if you're fleeing from the world, you can't take matter with you. Okay? With, with Platonist la, uh, language of participation or sharing in the divine life. So how do you think he's going to understand 2 Peter 1.4, partakers of the divine nature? He's going to understand it in terms of Platonic terms. So is Marius Victorinus Plato and Christian drag? <laughs> Uh, I know drag is kind of sensitive now because we're seeing it, unfortunately, in lots of places it shouldn't be, if at all. But in any case, commenting on Victorinus' interpretive practice of sticking close to the text, right? He just sticks to the text. He's just exe uh, exegeting. Cooper writes, it is certainly true for the most part, but only until the commentator, Victorinus, comes to a passage where the apostle touches on deeper matters of the Christian mysterium as Victorinus likes to call the Christ event, the economia, and all its effects in the broad sweep of eternity to incarnation, death, and resurrection. Then he abandons the basic literalism of his method and makes what Paul says the occasion to expatiate on divine and human realities. Because of his sketch of Paul's theology and soteriology, penitently draws on Platonist ideas. So soteriology is 
drawing on Platonic ideas. Modern scholars tend to regard Victorinus as guilty of anachronism. He's reading stuff from later periods back in the earlier figures. Now, Cooper gives a little defense here. Such a charge itself is anachronistic, meaning that we have to judge Victorinus by the standards of his time. Did people do that? Yes, they did. Modern standards is not acceptable. Cooper says, one can hardly expect an ancient commentator to do otherwise in an explicitly theological commentary. Fine. By the own standards of his day, he's not being anachronistic. But is he really being anachronistic? Is he really importing platonic stuff into Paul? Yes, he is. This is why when you read his commentary in Galatians, you have to figure out what he means by his terms. You can't just assume that he means what you think he means just because you're seeing Pauline language. Well, we cannot gainsay the fact, Cooper says, that Victorinus read aspects of late Platonic teachings, Platonist teachings, into the letters of Paul. We must contextualize this within the context of fourth century Trinitarian debates, where he was hardly alone or hardly exceptional in attributing a more systematic and philosophical doctrine of God to the Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle than Paul may have actually possessed. Okay. He's not exceptional. This doesn't mean he's not doing it. He's still doing it. Just other people are doing it. Widening the scope doesn't, of people doing something doesn't mean that it's not being done. The centrality of soteriological concerns in the Apostles' correspondence provided the opening for Victorius's importation of a philosophical anthropology into Paul's disparate utterances about the soul's potential to be changed. And he references 1 Corinthians 15, 51. What's that about? That's about the resurrection. So he understands the resurrection body as the soul just being changed. Soteriology is the other great area where, Cooper says, Victorinus, Victorinus's Platonist learnings allowed him to be formulate what the educated of his time would have received as a scientific understanding of how souls could emerge from their prodigal erring to regain the heavenly seat. The freedom with which he interpreted Christianity in light of Platonist teachings about the soul was possible because prior to the originist controversy, there were no doctrinal parameters of what, what could be said in this regard. I guess he never heard of Solus Comptora. So basically, before people started blaming origin for teaching this stuff, you could get away with it. Yet Victorinus' readiness to bring Platonist thinking en masse in its entirety, not a little bit of Platonism, the whole enchilada into the Christian fold should not obscure the fact that he regarded the church, its canon and its creed as fully authoritative. So he, he's fine. Sure, I believe in scripture. Sure, I believe the creed. Sure, I believe, regard the church as great. It's authoritative. But just means that you're just teaching Platonism. In the end, Victorinus followed Christ, but was happy to bring what truth Plato and his followers had been able to discover apart from revelation of the mystery in the gospel. Yeah, in mass, Platonism in its entirety. He felt free to do that. Too good to be true, part two. We're getting closer to the end in case you're still here. Hopefully you're still here. Victorinus' English translator, Stephen Cooper, follows Harnack's lead in presenting Victorinus as a, quote, proto-Luther figure. Cooper sees this connection, especially in view of the, quote, strong sola fidean, which he gets from Charles Gore. And I've read all of Gore's commentaries, and Gore doesn't believe in sola fide either. Justification by faith alone tendency in some of Victorinus' statements, which of course, this is from Scheck, is also found in Luther's writing. The phrase sola fide by faith alone appears in Victorinus' commentary in Galatians 2, so on and so forth. It seems reasonable. Now, this is the question that Mr. Rogers should have asked himself with all of this background, which some of which he read in the commentary in the introductory material to Victorinus. How do I know? Because he talks about the statue. That's discussed in the uh, introductory material. It seems reasonable, however, to question whether Victorinus and Luther really meant the same thing when they spoke of justification by faith alone. That's a reasonable question. You can't assume that the phrase is there and a parallel discourse using Pauline language is expressing Pauline content. You can't assume it. You have to prove it. 
So we're going to start looking at some of the texts that of Marius Victorinus and uh, then one or two other things, and then we'll be done. So these are the texts uh, I believe that Mr. Rogers uses. <clears throat> this is in the intro. Now, the main point of the letter is this. The Galatians are going astray because they are linking the gospel of faith, which is a faith in Christ, to Judaism. So remember all that stuff that I told you about anti-Semitism in Rome and all the Platonist stuff and bodily rituals and Platonists not liking traditional religion, Greek religion, or any other in that respect. On account of their corporeal understanding, they observe, that is a body, they observe the Sabbath and circumcision. Likewise, other works they picked up from the law. Upset by these things, Paul wrote the letter wanting to correct them and summon them back to Judaism, um, from Judaism in order to keep faith in Christ alone. Okay. And to have hope of salvation from Christ, the hope of his promise promises. For no one is saved based on works of the law. Therefore, to put a stop to those additions they are making, Paul sets out to establish the truth of his gospel. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is they're retreating back to the material world by going to Judaism. They're not going to Christ by faith alone. That is, by an intellectual relation, a relation of nous, of suke, a soul. That's the problem. There's nothing here about faith as an instrumental cause. There's nothing here about uh, a created righteousness. There's nothing here about a taxonomic change. Get your get your defining sola fide checklist out. Look at the text. Where are the marks? Other than the phrase and, I mean, an anti-Pelagian of any general kind could agree with this. There's no sola fide here, Mr. Rogers. You just are looking at certain words and seeing a parallel structure and not understanding the context of the writer. Thus, they came to agree even on this matter, that the hope of salvation is not to be found in performing of works for the poor. Okay. Again, why would that be a problem for Victorinus? Because you do works for the poor, you got to use your body. And you're going to engross in matter because what do the poor need? Turns out they're hungry sometimes. More matter. And they need clothes. More matter. Money, more matter. But just what are they admonishing Paul and Barnabas to do? That we would be mindful of the poor. Not that we should expend all our efforts on this, but that we should provide for those who do not have what is within their our means. Okay? They admonish only that we should be mindful of the poor, not that we should put our concern or worries and all our strength in this matter, as if holding on to our, uh, to our salvation depended on it. Now, why would he think this? Because he thinks that's going back down the line, right? To a lesser, a lower level of being. Your salvation cannot consist of doing things that have to do with matter. It can only have to do with what's inside, the immaterial, the soul. So look for your, your sola fide check marks. Where, where are they? Is, is justice here understood quantitative? Does he exclude all merit simplicator? Maybe he may be doing that. He may be excluding all all, all uh, merit simplicator. But um, this is again, as I said, in, entirely understandable in terms of of uh, the descent back to matter. And this, the page number pagination is for um, that Mr. Rogers used for the Marius Victorinus commentary in Galatius from Cooper. The portion of the speech up to this point belongs to Paul himself, accusing Peter and telling him that he inappropriately went along with Judaism, thus inducing the Jew Gentiles to Judaize. We Jews, he says, that is you, I, Peter, and others who are sinners, however, not from the Gentiles. Rather, we are Jews, to be sure we do maintain faith in Christ. What precisely is our reason since we are Jews? Obviously, because we know that people are not justified based on works of the law, but are justified by, through faith, the faith in Jesus Christ. Now that sounds that sounds Pauline, but again, given what you know about him and how he understands those terms, what would you conclude? What would be reasonable to conclude, as Shrek said? Do they mean the same thing? Since we know knew this, Paul says, we have come to believe in Christ Jesus, and we believe in order that we might be justified based on faith, not works the law. Okay, this is consistent being justified based on faith. That's consistent with faith being a condition of justification, the ground of it. 
I don't have to interpret that. There's nothing in the text that requires me or indicates I should interpret that as an instrumental cause, as the reformers would have it. Not based on works of the law, seeing that no flesh, that is, the human being who is in flesh, oh, there's some Platonism, is justified based on the works of the law. So knowing this, that we have believed that our justification comes about through faith, we are surely going astray if we now return to Judaism, from which we passed over to be justified based not on works of works, but excuse me, faith and faith in Christ. For faith itself alone grants justification and sanctification. Okay, so at this point, um, Cho and Mr. Rogers interpret this as, see, he acknowledges the distinction between justification and sanctification. Well, just because he pairs them, he puts them contiguously, that's an awfully thin read to build the apparatus of a conceptual distinction between these two things, okay? Plenty of people have read the Pauline language of justification and sanctification being conjoined, uh, that is conjun conjunctively and not read it that way. That doesn't require that. You can't get that much out of the text. In other words, that dog don't hunt. Now notice, thus any flesh whatsoever. Now going to the previous line, for faith itself alone grants justification and sanctification. On the Reformed view, does faith alone grant sanctification? Maybe definitive sanctification, but not progressive sanctification. That is cooperative. So that might be a reason on a Reformed basis for thinking this is not really sola fide. And then look, thus, any flesh whatsoever. He's concerned. What, what do you think he thinks about flesh? What do you think he thinks that is? Sin, the, uh, a corrupted human existence? An ethically corrupted human existence, a human existence that is lacking divine power or the material body. Jews or these Gentiles is justified on the basis of faith, not works or observance of the Jewish law. So again, any anti-Pelagian could agree with this text. And interpreting it in its context, it's highly platonic. Look, he says right there. The human being, the man, Anthropos, who is in flesh, he's concerned about embodiment. He's not concerned about strict merit. If there is justice through the law, then Christ has died in vain. The conclusion about the errors of the Galatians and those who had Judaism and Christianity has been drawn. Surely, says Paul, if justice is through the law, Christ died for nothing. If Christ died because justification does not depend on the law, I ought to follow Christ um, alone. Okay. Anti-Pelagians agree, you should follow Christ alone. We don't consider good works as these separate things from Christ. We consider them to be Christ's works. As Paul says, Christ lives in me, right? It is not I who do these things. He can go so far as to exclude his own identity, Paul, but Christ. So uh, if, however, the coming of Christ, I believe myself to be justified through the law, Christ did not die on my account, has died in vain. That is, has died for no reason. To believe in Christ and to follow the works of the law is inconsistent, self-contradictory. Since the law consistently failed to justify mankind on the basis of his works, Christ came so that there would be justification for human, humankind by his death. There's nothing here particular to sola fide. There's no created righteousness, no instrumental or extrinsic cause, no conduit. Faith is a conduit for transfer of merit a separation of human activities and divine activities per se, because remember, he thinks of faith as a human activity. So this text, Mr. Rogers doesn't support sola fide either. Next text. And if it was not based on works of the law, why are you now adding a Jewish teaching? Notice he's concerned about Jewish teaching because he sees the Jews as being engrossed in and obsessed about material things, such that you would believe you will receive the spirit. So this is about receiving the spirit. Is the spirit created merit? No. Know about God and hope in God based on works of the law? Why do this when you have already received the spirit based on the hearing of faith? That is, how is he going to understand that? According to that platonic ethical instruction. That was the whole point of that literature that I cited there. That is because you, you heard that faith in Christ ought to be pursued. Because if it is based on hearing, it is now contrary to faith. Um, 
when you believe you will receive the spirit on the basis of works of the law. So this is about reception of the spirit. Nobody thinks that works, that Christ working in you, Christ performing good works through you, is you the, the ultimate ground of you receiving the spirit. To frame the matter this way is just a straw man. It would, con it would completely distort Augustine's own teaching. We would have to say Augustine had a false gospel. Now, you might want to say, well, he wasn't around yet at the Reformers, but Augustine read Marius Victorinus. Cooper and all the other scholars discuss all of this. He read his commentary. So what, Augustine didn't understand it? It's in Latin. They're both reading the same language. We know from his confessions, I think it's Confessions 8, that he read Marius Victorinus' works. So what, why didn't Augustine preserve this? Ambrosiaster was influenced by him too, read his works. And so did Pelagius. That's actually, that's the funny thing. Where do you think Pelagius got all those expressions of justification by faith alone? He got it from Marius Victorinus. None of these people who wrote commentaries interpreted him in a Reformation sense. And they're all there in a relatively proximate period of time speaking the same language. It's their native tongue. And Victorinus himself had access to the Greek, at least to some Greek texts. He's using the, uh, the Vetus Latina, I believe, for his biblical text, not the Greek text. But to read Plotinus, he had to be able to read Greek. So it's at least possible. So look, because by faith alone in Christ, the spirit is given and has been given to you. Well, that's consistent with believing that you have faith and then the spirit is given with you to you. That's, that's not justification by faith alone. Again, no instrumental causality. No faith is an empty virtue. This is all consistent with faith being a condition for the coming of the spirit. Paul has described what based on works of the law and based on hearing of faith mean. Victorina says, clearly the works of the law it meant nothing other than placating the flesh, the body. Experiencing the feelings of the flesh and aiding the flesh. Therefore, one who believes himself to be justified based on works of the law is wise according to the flesh. Therefore, you are so stupid, he says, so lacking in understanding, lacking understanding and adding works for your justification. What does he think works are? Bodily acts. Right? Not inner virtues. That would be excluded on sola fide if he excluded all other virtues. But he doesn't. Which implies being wise according to the flesh. So that although you be, began with the spirit by the gospel as I gave it to you, you would now bring an end to your life and pro progress with the flesh. That is the body. That is with works. You have taken up for the flesh. And according to the flesh. Okay. So again, use your sola fide checklist. Given what you know about Maurice Victorinus' view on how he understands these terms, again, remember, Mr. Rogers read a whole text from Pseudo-Jerome, didn't know it was from Pelagius, and read into it a meaning that wasn't even there. This is what's happening with all of these other texts. There's nothing here that expresses sola fide. If, if there is, I'd like somebody sometime to point out, you know, I mean, maybe I'm open to having, you know, Mr. Rogers seems like a really nice guy. I mean, granted, he's in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, and I'm in Mr. Robinson's neighborhood. And if you're an SNL fan, you know Mr. Robinson's neighborhood is a little tougher, given the presentation. But I, I'm cool with sitting down and breaking beer with him and, and talking about this stuff. I, I mean, and he's he's Italian. I mean, he's Sicilian, and I'm Calabrese. But, you know, hey, um, no, it is perfect. So... But look, I mean, there's no reason to interpret these things this way. There's nothing in the text that indicates what the reformers had in mind. So for next text, for example, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as justice. That is laid down in Genesis. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as justice. So if you were going to preach sola fide, this might be a text, biblical text. You might want to start talking about a created righteousness, a faith as an instrument, give some analogies, right? Talk about it's just your standing. It has nothing to do with what you are. That might be the place. This is the way that God works powers. When faith arises in people's soul, a faith such that they believe in God. So how does he interpret the case of Abraham being justified? Well, God's working miracles on the basis of faith. You have faith and then God gives you power. 
the faith such that they believe in God. Because Abraham believed God, Paul says, it was counted, counted to him as justice. Well, that's consistent with taking faith as the condition of justification. Something that pleases God, and God accepts that as righteousness instead of works. There's no indication here of sola fide. For this reason, then, you too suffered, endured, and conquered so many things. And for this reason, God has worked and does um, uh, what should be like, I think, wonderful powers among you. Because you believed God through a hearing of faith. Next text. To the seed of Abraham have promised many things. Now, Abraham himself was found acceptable as regards justice. Based on what? Based on the merits of Christ that are forensically imputed to him? No, based on his faith. Fits very easily with faith as a condition. All of those who stand on the basis of faith then are among the children of Abraham. What do they stand on? Imputed righteousness? A taxonomic change? A reclassification? No. They stand on the basis of faith. As I've often pointed out, the entire mysterium the economia, which was enacted by our Lord Jesus Christ, requires, what does it require? Faith alone. How does he understand faith alone? He's not understanding it as an instrumental cause. Looks like he's understanding it as, an, as a condition. For then will it have been enacted on our behalf, enacted for a resurrection and liberation. What, what is liberation for Mars Victorinus? It's not salvation from sin. It's removal from the body. If we but have faith in Christ and in the mystery of Christ, for by this treatment, Abraham, the divine reality set out beforehand and gave advance notice that human beings would be justified based on faith. As it was accounted to Abraham, notice this phrasing, as it was accounted to Abraham as justice. That seems to have the sense that faith is something valuable that God accepts that as justice. Then because he had faith, therefore, if we have faith in Christ and his whole mystery, we too shall be ch will be children of Abraham. That's faith as a condition. That's not sola fide. This means that our whole life will be accounted to us as justice. Indeed, Paul has added along these lines, the mystery was carried out in the case of Abraham on the grounds that human beings would be justified based on faith. Obviously, the faith in Christ. Next text. As we've been saying, the whole letter of Galatians works to combat one thing that the Galatians thought, Victorinus says, that they had to safeguard the gospel and keep the faith in Christ in conjunction with Jewish teaching and observance. The Apostle Paul teaches that this is not the case, that he did not give instructions along those lines and was hoping for justification and salvation on the basis of works of the law. He is in every way mistaken, for all things come about on the basis of faith. That sounds like a condition. The promise was given to Abraham based on faith and thus to a seed as well it is clearly a promise of liberation of justification and inheritance in heaven going back to the immaterial home and above heaven this being the case he teaches in every way that no justification no liberation no inheritance no return back to the primordial unity comes about on the basis of law and works that is bodily acts even if they are fulfilled according to precepts that is the moral law now, Mr. Rogers made a big point of this. Now, even if we put all the platonic stuff aside, this doesn't necessarily exclude an Augustinian account. Remember, Augustine read it. Um, if we interpret this in the sense of works um, in terms of strict merit, then yeah, it excludes even strict merit. But again, as I said at the beginning, Augustine and any anti-Pelagian doesn't think that um, an increase of justice or that our good works please God, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, doesn't think that that's proportional, that that's a matter of strict merit. Right? As Augustine says, God crowns our merits. Augustine doesn't say we don't have merits. He says he crowns our merits. Grace perfects nature. It does not obliterate nature. It does not exclude nature. It perfects it. Now, we'll see why the issue of strict merit is important in Victorinus later, in a little bit. But here, even this insistence on if they are fulfilled according to the precepts, none of the other language is necessarily requires us to understand this or exhibits sola fide. 
It's just, it's just sheeps in the clouds. It is for this reason, because the law is under attack in every way, the question was rightly posed. What then, he says, is the law opposed to the promises? Is, is the law opposed to the promises? And indeed, if the law accomplishes nothing on the basis of its works, so the law lacks power, it lacks dynamis, comes later than the promises. For the promises to Abraham are earlier, and the law given through Moses comprises only the justice pertaining to deeds. Okay, so we have moral precepts. Now, why would a Platonist be concerned about justice according to deeds? Well, if you read the Republic from Plato, not to mention a mess of other Platonic works, uh, rule following isn't real justice. Real justice is inside. It's not out there. The law seems somehow mistakenly given or contrary to the promise. For if works based on the law achieve nothing and produce nothing, the law is contrary to the promise. But the promises guarantee inheritance and justification. As long as this law, which is based on works, calls souls away from faith. What does he mean by souls? It doesn't mean just human beings. He means like souls, like immaterial things. So what's the problem here? The law gets you involved in doing stuff in the world. About what you can eat and what you can't eat, what you can wear and what you can't wear, and even moral precepts are mixing you up with the world. You shouldn't waste your time with the world. You should be working up on this to go back up there. That's his idea. As long, notice this, as long as it keeps souls occupied in some other thing. Remember, these are all texts that Mr. Rogers read. That he read them. He spent two hours on Marius Victorinus, saying this teaches the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith alone. Two hours he talked about it. Over two hours, almost three. So the so the problem is distraction with worldly things, that is material world, resulting in their looking for the promises not based on faith, but on something else, that is works. The law is opposed to the promises, but um, I think I, I mistyped that. That's a mistake on my part. I think it should be the law is not opposed to the promises. But because God also gave the law, it is unlikely that this law could, on the other hand, be considered opposed to the promises. At any event, the law is opposed to the promises if it keeps us, what? Occupied with something else. Then what? Your inner disposition. I mean that we would fulfill the works committed on the basis of law and not look for what has been promised on the basis of faith. What's that? A return. Look, so as to obtain the inheritance of the heavens. How does he understand that? You're going back home from your pre-existence. I mean, like Mormons would have like be just fine with this. In God by faith. This is how we will interpret his response to the objection. Talking about Paul. First, he gives a general denial. Far be it. That is, it is unfitting that something done by God would seem opposed to the promise. That is the law. This would imply that law in keeping people occupied with matters voids the promise and makes it a matter of merit and not faith so that we would obtain justification by merit, having done all the works and not by faith alone. Now you might be thinking, ah, oh, Perry, I got you here. Look, he says right there, makes it a matter of merit. Now, if you mean strict merit, which is entirely possible, that's not a problem because nobody teaches strict merit. No anti-Pelagian, whether a Catholic theologian that, that I know or Orthodox or Coptic or any of the other traditional Christian bodies, they don't teach strict merit. So this does not touch their view. And on top of that, this should be interpreted according to his platonic con uh, context. He has a problem with being engrossed in bodily things and thinking that bodily things can please God and move you up that great chain of being. So I don't think that this text that Mr. Rogers cites teaches sola fide either. So we're making progress. We're getting closer to the end. Uh, so thank you for staying with me. But scripture has contained all things under sin in order that the promise would be given to the believers based on faith in Jesus Christ. This was accomplished, says Paul, through Moses, that he would indeed institute a law about sin, that the whole of scripture would be about sin, and that all things which are under sin be contained in it, so that what was promised would come about based on, sounds like a condition, faith. 
and the inheritance that is going back to the eternal realm be given to those who believe based on faith in Jesus Christ, faith as a condition, not as an instrumental cause. So that what he is doing or what he did he accomplish by means of all this, that faith alone in Jesus Christ would suffice for our justification and what? Our liberation. Oh, so faith alone is how you get removed from the body? That's how he understands this. I, he's understanding justification as the virtue of justice that's in the soul. And that's what enables you to be redirected to go back up to the primordial unity. Again, this is not expressing sola fide. And again, remember, Pelagius used the same term. Lots of people use the same term. Doesn't mean the same thing. Now, this is something great that Christ would not just provide a way of life for them or get them excited about eternal life with his precepts, but he came in order to redeem, he says, that which was accomplished in the mystery, that he would redeem all who believe in him, that all who believe in him might become adopted sons. Okay, that's not sola fide. Therefore, because so great a boon, and here Mr. Rogers got really kind of animated, because the whole boon is based on Christ. Nothing further need be added, nor must the law be kept. Okay, what is the what is a boon? That's the benefit. Okay, all anti-Pelagians agree. All the benefit, the benefit is based on Christ. You can't add anything to Christ. The only reason this becomes a problem is because Mr. Rogers and other Protestants are interpreting Christ acts through his people as something added, something separate from Christ. That's a straw man. That's not how Augustine understands it. That is not generally how the Christian tradition, both East and West, even within the Roman Imperium and outside the Roman Imperium, understands this. Now, nor must the law be kept. Now, if he means moral precepts there, that's going to kind of sound a little antinomian, right? You can just live whatever way you want. That might be a little problematic. For we have been redeemed, redeemed from the law and redeemed from what? This world. How is he understanding this? It's a platonic escape hatch that we might be sons of God, but sons by adoption. We are not sons like the son himself. That's good. But our sons through the son. Good stuff. This then is the adoption for us to receive it, Paul says. God sent his son. Okay. But this boon, the whole boon, the whole benefit being based on Christ, that's that's not sola fide. Nothing further be added. Well, that depends on what he's expressing here. There's more than one way historically, and people who spoke Latin at the time understood that. They didn't understand that in a sola fide sense. So this text doesn't teach sola fide either. What blessedness was therefore yours? Here he is showing that they are now in a bad state, if, if indeed blessedness had previously been their lot. When they received Jesus Christ, having received Paul as an angel of God, great, he says, was your blessedness. Was, he says, so now the situation is clearly different with you adding on things which I did not teach, that is Paul, and did not instill, and things which were outside the gospel. Clearly those things which I have been discussing above, which are the ceremonial laws and the law in general. I bear you witness that had it been possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. You took me in in this way. You had such enthusiasm toward me, talking about Paul, such goodwill toward me, so that even your very eyes, nothing is dearer to people than their eyes, you would have wanted to tear out and give to me. Okay, so there's more text I had to try and split it up. But looking at this, there's nothing here that teaches sola fide. So let's go on to the next section. Therefore, because you love me in this way and also love me on account of the gospel, where did you get this notion of yours to attach things not preached by me to the teaching? So the problem here is to be interpreted in the context that Victorinus is understanding it and Paul is writing is Judaizers. Right. And Victorinus in terms of bodily acts being pleasing to God. This is how it is that beyond Christ, you would perform something of the law instead of hoping for all things in Christ. Oh, now here's the question. Can you hope to please God in Christ? 
And the difference between pleasing God and his favor is what? Nothing. That's why everything depends on whether it's in Christ or not in Christ. Having hope, faith, and an inclination to believe. So hoping for all things in Christ is what? Having hope, having faith, and a willingness to believe. Well, that's not faith alone. That's faith plus two other things. How is it that you wouldn't believe you could obtain all things in Christ, the remission of sins, sanctification, and glory of God? This is all just talking that Christ is the source. It's the origination thesis. Uh, Anti-Pelagians don't think they're doing autonomous works apart from God, God's grace or apart from Christ. Again, it's Christ living in me. So here's some mitigating material. So we've gotten to the end of the of the text that the majority of texts that Mr. Rogers used. I did not do all the texts that Mr. Rogers used. I took out the ones that I thought were the strongest. If he feels that there's ones that I should have dealt with, I'm happy to discuss that with him. But given how long this has gone, I picked out, I think, like a dozen or so. And I think you can just apply the same criteria in analysis to see that they don't express sola fide either. So here's some mitigating material from Marius Victorinus. However, seeing that Paul frequently expresses himself this way, as the Savior himself also does, that was a footnote number I didn't remove, it could seem that he has mentioned two laws here for the reason that the very same law is twofold, so to speak. There is one law when it is understood in a fleshly manner. What does fleshly mean for Victorinus? Body. Not a Pauline sense of fleshly, not carnal, body. And then there is another law when it is understood spiritually, that is immaterially. Previously, it was understood in a fleshly manner, and one kept the law based on its works, on circumcision with its other observances. Notice all bodily activities. Understood in a fleshly manner. But after the Savior, the true spiritual light appeared, the law began to be understood spiritually. It was as if a different law had been created, although it is the very same law. So notice here, there's no reformation use of the law of imperative and indicative. It's the law under uh, thinking of it in a corporeal manner and the law thinking of it in a platonic immaterial manner. That's what's happening. This is not reformation teaching. This is platonic teaching using Paul. Therefore, the meaning of the verse will be this, for I through the law, which is now understood, understood spiritually, died to the law, obviously to that law understood in a fleshly manner. That is, I don't need to be concerned with doing with things of the body. And because this is the case, since I am now understanding the law spiritually, I have died to the fleshly law, that is the body, bodily law, that I might live to God. Go back up. People live to God when they understand the precepts laid down on the law, not in a fleshly manner, but spiritually. That is when they understood what it means to be truly circum circumcised, what the true Sabbath and rest and the rest mean. So let's talk about the Sabbath rest. Okay. So look, is he understanding death to the law, the Pauline language of dying to the law, right? The law came and I died and all of that language. Um, is he understanding that in a Pauline way? No, he's not. Again, the dialectic is between the immaterial world and the material world. And he's advanced from, he thinks, he's, this is, he thinks this is what Paul is expressing, that Paul is expressing that he advanced from dealing with stuff with the body to dealing with immaterial stuff. And I'm pretty sure that's not Reformation teaching. So these are all reasons to help you contextualize more what you're seeing from Mr. Rogers. For example, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as justice. This is laid down in Genesis. Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him as justice. This is the way God works. Uh, powers, when faith people souls, they face such that they believe in God. Because Abraham believed God, Paul says, it was accounted to him as justice. For this reason, then, too, you have suffered and endured. I think I actually used this text earlier. So, in any case, uh, yeah, I did use this text. So, this is a mistake. I'm just going to skip over this. Commentary on Galatians 4.9. Therefore, because he specified the beggarly elements of this world. Now, how do you think that Marius Victor, Victorinus is going to understand Paul's language about being in servitude to the elements of this world? 
being a slave to matter. Yeah, that's how he understood it. Let us understand that Galatians understanding the law in a fleshly manner appear to have turned back to elements which are beggarly. For flesh always goes begging, that is the body. It is always longing to be comforted with foods, drinks, and its desires. All of which things, this is all classic Platonism. All of which things, however, are infirm, that is they're unstable. So why, asks he, says he, are you turning back to infirm and beggarly elements? That is to things which are always, that always go begging. For the soul and spirit need beg for nothing. For they do not long for anything except those things which are their own. Why does the spirit and soul beg for nothing? Because they're immaterial. So the material, the immaterial is superior to the material. This is how he's reading Paul. And they concern themselves only with what's in themselves. They recollect, they look inward. This is what he was saying until Christ be formed in you. Oh, sounds biblical. For every soul is capable of receiving Christ. Um, no total depravity there. The human soul, if it makes use of what? Reason. Huh, Platonic philosopher talking about Paul and Christ being formed in you using reason. I say if it realizes, how does it use reason? That the world is not its own. If it distinguishes all things in the world, and if it recognizes its own creator, the human soul is capable of receiving Christ. What he's saying is if the, anybody who uses reason is capable of ascending this is what he's expressing. Right? He realized that this world is not his own. He doesn't mean that in a biblical sense. He means that in the sense that the soul is trapped in a body. It's not your real self. Your body is not your real self. For Victorinus. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but faith which works through love counts. What counts? And who does it count before? I think it counts before God. And that language of circumcision and uncircumcision is also found in Paul in, I believe, Corinthians, where he talks that neither of those two things count, but keeping the commandments of God, which is a nice different Pauline expression. Everywhere, Paul states that when it comes to faith, all else ceases to count. This means social status, gender, what he probably translated gender as sex, and anything done that concerns what? The body. Whether about, on, or for the sake of the body circumcision works or other practices of this sort none of these he says counts for anything in christ why because the body can't be in christ it's matter therefore circumcision is useless although it is not as if we count as anything in christ on the basis of our uncircumcision because we have taken a faith in him because we believe in his promises and because we ourselves rise up on the basis of his resurrection as we have suffered all things with him we also rise with him Though through him to life, our faith is sure. Okay. Continuing. So this is all material that Mr. Rogers read and kind of passed over. It should have jumped out at him that something else other than what Paul has in mind, if he read the introductory material, something else than what Paul has in mind is actually going on in Victorinus. This is not a proto-Luther. Through this faith comes our working for salvation. Oh, well, that's not going to work with sola fide. And it behooves us to take it on through what? Through the love which we have for Christ. This starts to sound like either the confession of Docetius or the Council of Trent. Which I take in large member to be measure to be talking about the same general idea with respect to justification. For God, enhanced toward every person. For those, these two have the greatest corrective effort of every life. Fulfill the whole force of the law and contain all things which are precepts in the in the Decalogue. Wait, wait, wait. Love, faith working through love fulfills the whole force of the law? If faith in me and love in me fulfills the law, why do I need a created righteousness that's external to me? Kind of reminds me of Paul in Romans 8, where he says the requirements of the law shall be fulfilled, will be fulfilled in us, in, not external. If it follows, follows of necessity that those who keep faith would uphold love, these two fulfill all that, all that the law of Christ teaches. I have dealt, uh, dealt very often with these matters that faith liberates. What does he mean by liberate? 
freedom from the body, and love builds up. So love is going to help you ascend back to the primordial unity. Therefore, it is better to set one's hope on the spirit that we might have hope from the spirit, a hope from the spirit whose fruit is from the spirit. This is what to sow in the spirit means. Okay, he's going to tell you what it means. To sow eternal life. Surely this life is life, not eternal life. Those, however, who live here in the spirit and act according to the spirit, where's here, material world, do nothing in a fleshly way. They are sowing life eternal for themselves. Wait, I thought they already had it by justification by faith alone. How are they sowing, planting something that will sprout to eternal life for them if it's already complete? This justice is complete. It's forensic. They already have it. It's total. Can't be sanctification. Because sanctification doesn't produce eternal life on a reformation uh, paradigm. Only justification uh, warrants that. Sanctification is all, progressive sanctification is all the stuff that gets cleaning you out before you get there on a reformation view. And this will be the harvest for them. Departing from here, they will receive eternal life. What do you think he means by departing from here? Disembodiment. Commentary on Ephesians 1.8. So now we're starting to get into um, this book, Commentary on Ephesians, which was actually, I have to admit, I really don't blame Mr. Rogers for not re maybe not reading this. I don't know if he read it or not, but it was very difficult to get. So that's understandable. But knowing of its existence and knowing the guys, the Platonist might be better to be a little more cautious. But the soul amongst all those has merited more from God. Uh, wait, what? The soul amongst all of those, meaning other souls, has merited more from God, both the greatest gift and greatest riches. This is on Ephesians 1.8. When knowing God, all by, by means of the will of God, infused in it, infusion, not imputed, infused by Jesus Christ, the soul accepted among the sons of God, is granted to be near to God and to the Son. That is Jesus Christ. So the soul is not Jesus Christ here. Still, and these are the, um, this is Cooper's brackets. All this comes about through Christ himself. As the soul made out, the co-heir of eternity and majesty is granted the name and position of Son. Well, wait a minute. I thought Maurice Victorinus excluded all merit from the Christian life. It looks like here in Ephesians, he's talking about a soul that merits, gets something, deserve more. it's more deserving from God. He even looks his greatest gift and greatest riches. So maybe Maurice Victorinus isn't completely opposed to any kind of notion of merit. Maybe it's only some kinds of merit he has a problem with. Next quote on Ephesians 1.14. For this is what the redemption of adoption expressed that we might be redeemed from these worldly, earthly, bodily, and fleshly evils. Again, escape from the body. And be redeemed for the adoption and exist as sons. This matter belongs more to the glory and grace of God than to our merit. Notice this. It belongs more to one than the other. Not absolutely one and not the other. So we either he's being inconsistent in his commentary on Ephesians, which was really written in a relatively short period of time compared to his commentary on Galatians. Or Mr. Rogers has seriously misread all of that anti-merit stuff in the commentary on Galatians. For the gift which is received is great beyond merit. So now here, look, it looks like he's talking about what Augustine has in mind. That there's no proportionality. There's no strict merit, right? It's just that which is received is beyond merit. The glory belongs to the one who gave it, not to the one who received it. So there's an origination thesis there. You're not the origin of it, so you can't claim it. That's why it's disproportionate. It's still merit, though. So that's compatible with the confession of josephus the council of trent i don't know what the cops or the assyrians have but i don't think they would balk at this they don't believe in sola fide so i guess he believed in some kind of merit 
Um, I think I, I duplicated that. So let's go to the next slide. Ephesians 3.17, he writes, these are the riches of God. So you've read this passage before. We look forward even to the glory and the promise rooted and grounded in love. Right? Paul says that he wishes you'd be rooted and grounded in love. This most important precept has been laid down everywhere by Paul. Got that right. And has been presented to me frequently by way of admonition for the stability and foundation. The whole status of the soul with respect to eternity is what? In, in faith alone? Is it in faith alone? No, is in love. This makes, what does it do to our faith? Rooted and grounded. Now, I know what Reformed people will say, we don't oppose love. We don't oppose these things, right? Um, that's true. But this certainly looks like the notion of formed faith. It looks like it. It's not hard to see it that way. But there's more. Uh Ephesians, uh, let's see here. Here we go. 613. For only faith in Christ fortifies us so that no temptation of those powers of the world could prevail against us. So here he's thinking of faith as a kind of power, which is consistent with the Platonic idea of faith or other things as a virtue. In this way, what was seemingly seeming difficult to resist has been made easy. Well, wait, God does everything or it's we still have a part to do. It's just easy. Oh, I guess it's just easy. If that whereby we resist is within our power, but it is in our power for to have faith in Christ and to have full faith is no labor, no difficulty. The will of the soul is so compliant, so believing. No bondage of the will here. Therefore, it becomes easy to resist these many evil powers if we have faith. For faith alone suffices, withstands, alone fortifies, but only a faith, a full faith. That's starting to sound like formed faith again. Although the Lord himself said that if we should have a grain of faith as much as a grain of salt, it's actually mustard seed, we're able to command mountains. Okay. Therefore, a sincere faith, a pure faith, I say a faith in Christ and in God will provide us arms against these many powers. Here he talks about faith in line as a virtue has a power of the soul. In fact, Socrates talks about the, the, these things as the virtues of the souls, justice, temperance, love. These are the jewels of the soul. That's entirely reasonable to interpret him this way. Ephesians 6.14, the apostle adds another precept beyond faith that we should maintain justice. Oh, although the precept had been spoken of earlier, that is faith, is itself the head of them all. Now, why is he okay with justice here? Well, because justice isn't an external thing. It's a state of the soul. All you have to do is read Plato's Republic to see that is the case for Platonists. The fact is that justice is not as powerful as faith. The fact is the just man lives from faith. Nevertheless, because this attitude of faith is also to be implemented so that we are just, he added, after faith, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, for then will faith be what? Wait, I thought faith was advantageous on its own. Then it will be true faith. So it's only true faith if it has justice. This again starts to sound like foreign faith. Faith is completed just as James says, just as the soul make bo the body alive, so works makes faith perfect or complete. Justice too will be advantageous if faith exists as well. So they work together. They are mutually beneficial and co, co-working. Like you might say, they're involved in synergy. Now look, we're getting closer to the end. Victory in his initial comments on three six, right? Abraham believed God has credited him as righteousness. Recalls the reader to the context and then arranges the vocabulary of the verse to clarify the sequence of events. One event, Abraham's faith is the ground of the other. Remember when I was talking about faith as a ground or a condition? Right here. This is Cooper saying this. This is his own, Roger's own source. God's accounting it to him as justice. Referring back to 3, 1 through 4, Victorinus illustrates how in the case of Galatians, God provided grace in response to faith. 
The Galatians were able to withstand adversities since God worked powers in them on the account of their faith. The comment on 3.7 gets the illuminating paraphrase, accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham himself was found acceptable as regards justice on the basis of what? The imputed merits of Christ? A created righteousness from Christ? No, on the basis of his faith. Why? As he says above, Abraham's faith is the ground of what? Him being justified. That's not faith as an instrumental cause. The truncated survival of Victorinus's work on Paul does not allow, now notice what he says, does not allow, as, as we have averred, any full comparison of Victorinus's understanding of justification with that of Augustine. So we don't even know, we're not even in a position to compare it with that of Augustine. Well, then how can we compare it to the reformers? From the commentary on Galatians, however, we can see that victory has probably remained within the bounds of what? The synergistic understanding of the relationship between divine grace and human will, typical of both Greeks and Latins, as Alfred Schindler pointed out in an insightful, if underread, article from 1965. It's back, it's back a while. Yet, as other scholars from Gore to Harnack have noted, a definite approach to Augustine's doctrine approach can be ascertained in the West in the second half of the fourth century. That's fair. What I want to point out here is that the Reformation was sparked in part, not because of indulgences and all those things. Luther says that himself. It was sparked by this kind of semi-Pelagianism, that people of their own natural ability can move themselves to, to uh, faith or prepare themselves for faith apart from grace. Okay? So that's why Reformed people are usually will say that Arminians and other people really can't believe in justification by faith alone. Why? Because their faith is, is going to be considered a meritorious contribution to justification. So if Marius Victorinus is within the bounds of a synergistic understanding between divine grace and human will, it's highly improbable that he believes in justification by faith alone. Because justification by faith alone excludes all human activity. He doesn't. Again, that's Cooper. That, that's his own source. That's the commentary on Galatians, page 169. Okay, mopping up. This is the last section. Thank you all for being so very patient. I know this is a lot of stuff, but again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For Victorinus, justification. This is Mr. Cho again. So we're going to dismiss Mr. Cho. So what I'm doing here is I'm pointing out some problems in Mr. Cho. I can't do a full analysis, but why I think it's problematic. For Victorinus, justification is a matter of how sinners could be righteous before God. That's true. Faith alone in Christ, neither observation of the law, nor meritorious works, that depends on how you understand the term, could give them the righteousness that makes them acceptable to God. Now watch this. To many contemporary scholars' surprise, our, Paul, our ancient Pauline commentator shows a concept of the alien righteousness of justification long before Luther, which is a text that Mr. Rogers, I believe, cited. Well, when you look on that page, um, for the many scholars, there's no references at all to these scholars. Now, many, you should at least put three or four, right? But there's nothing there. Secondly, he's equivocating on the term alien righteousness here. What does Luther mean by alien righteous, righteousness? He means a taxonomic classification, the way you're classed, Right? Did we see anything in Marius Victorinus about nominalist or nominalistic classification? No, we didn't. And there isn't in any of the other texts either. So alien here, the equivocation is on alien versus a nominalist taxonomy versus alien in having an, a primary cause or an ultimate source in God and not you. So Mr. Uh, Cho here is committing the fallacy of equivocation kind of sleight of hand. In his exposition of uh, uh, Philippians 3.9, Victorinus unmistakably elaborates that the righteousness of justification belongs to God alone. Well, again, he's equivocating. It depends on what he means. And has nothing to do with believers' inner holiness. That depends. Does, is he talking about inner holiness apart from grace? Because he seems to think in the commentary in Ephesians that justice, and even in the Galatians commentary, in one of the quotes that Mr. Rogers put, he links hope with faith as a basis for justification. 
and hope and faith are not faith alone. So this inner holiness stuff is just begging the question again. If we earn justifying righteousness, quote, by living without blame, in other words, by our moral behaviors, quote, unquote, we could call the justifying righteousness my or our righteousness. Well, that depends. Is he talking about bodily behaviors or not? This is why I don't take Mr. Cho's article very seriously, not to mention that there's a whole bunch of other scholars who disagree with him. Next, Cho says, in other words, Victorinus presents faith as an intellectual agreement with the gospel, failing to include personal trust in Christ in his definition of faith. So he's talking about Schmid's view. Unlike Schmid, we will see that Victorinus defines faith as both true knowledge of Christ. And how is, given all the information you have about him being a Platonist, how should you understand that? True knowledge is not biblical sense, and his mystery and a personal union with Christ in a way that the 16th century late reformers were later affirmed. Now, take your understanding that I gave you with respect to what he understands, the great chain of being. Um, were the reformers teaching the great chain of being? Is that how they understood union with Christ? No. Calvin is, draw is drawing from Bernard of Clairvaux. You can see that in Tremberello's, uh, Temberello's book. Um, it's not Platonism. Here, it's like Cho didn't even read the commentary on Ephesians. It's like he didn't even read uh, Cooper's articles that half a, you know a number of articles. Not to mention the other scholars on this. Let Victorinus defend himself against these two scholars' charges. For Victorinus, same faith consists of two elements: quote to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and to believe in His atoning death and forgiveness, resurrection forgiveness uh, for for our forgiveness. Excuse me. Well, that's a very general statement. How does Victorinus understand that? We've already covered this. So Cho is just using Christian terms and pretending Victorinus is expressing himself in a Christian sense. It's really hard to tell. In a lot of ways, he's not. To believe is not merely a matter of knowledge about Christ and his ministry. This is Cho again. Faith entails not only the objective knowledge of Christ, he's giving a gloss on Victorinus, but believers' personal union with Christ through their existential participation in his mysteries. Yeah, pre-existence of soul falling into bodies. Okay. To believe in Christ is to, quote, perceive spiritually. What do you think he means by that? Quote, to be raised up from the fleshly and material desires. Again, so Cho would have us believe that Platonism is the expression of Christianity? And to unite with this and join us to Christ. Since we are united with God through Christ in his mystery, there is no hope for our salvation except to believe in Christ. Faith enables believers to appropriate existentially and to participate actually in all the blessings in the mystery of Christ. Really? That's what Victorinus is saying? I mean, I, I, I'm just giving you a taste. There is a ton of Platonism in here. Not to mention this, but in the commentary on uh, Philippians and in um, Galatians. He, he's just fudging here. Those who, peop those who believed in Christ died and rose again, not only with him, but through Christ. Okay. This appropriation and participation in the mystery of Christ by faith alone made Abraham accept by God in the matter of righteousness. We've already seen how he understands faith alone with respect to Abraham. It's the condition. It's not the instrument of created righteousness being imputed. All right. Certainly, Victorinus presents the predestination of God. This was great as the cause of sanctification of the souls in Ephesians 1, 4. Therefore, God predestined and chose them, them souls before the foundation of the world in order that they might be sanctified, that is strengthened by accepting the spirit and becoming spirit when all the vices which could fall upon them have been put aside. So according to Cho, Marius Victorinus teaches predestination um, excluding foreseen merits. This sounds Calvinistic. But you saw what Marius Victorinus says in, in about Ephesians 1-4 and other passages in Ephesians. Well, of course, it's not on um, uh, it's not on the basis of foreseen merits, right? And of course, predestination is going to be the cause of our sanctification. Well, why? Because he thinks you pre-existed as a soul before you came into body. Again, Cho is being misleading here. So, so, yeah, you look at the footnote. I left that number in there on purpose. So this is the footnote that's supposed to support that, which could fall upon them, have been put aside. 
Victorinus never implies that the divine predestination is conditioned by divine foreknowledge. Well, that's kind of an argument for silence. Of the human response to the gospel. Instead, he highlighted the divine initiation in choosing men to holiness. Yeah, they existed in a primordial existence prior to coming into body. Now, if you just read what Cho said, you think that Victorinus was teaching the Calvinist or even Augustinian view that God elects people uh, not on the basis of foreseen merits or actions. That's the impression you would get. But if you had read the actual commentary on Ephesians, you would know that's not what the basis is. That's not what he's expressing. It can't be on the basis of foreseen merits because it's on the basis of pre-existence. All right, next, we're getting closer to the end. The assumption that Victorine is teaching on sola fide results from his Neoplatonic dualism between spirit and matter might have resulted from a failure to recognize his real concern about Judaizing Christians in his own environs. If Victorinus was merely a baptized Neoplatonist, he could have approached the Bible with a spiritual exegesis that would have promoted Platonic spirituality. Um, did you read the same book I did? In contrast to heretical Christian groups who were influenced by Neoplatonism and Gnosticism, however, Victorinus valued water baptism as a rite of the church and an institutional religious organization. His ecclesiology shows that his Neoplatonic dualism has been more or less overcome. This is just false, and here's why it's false. Remember when I said earlier that while the Platonists were critical of popular religion, whether pagan or Christian or Jewish, they did engage, allow space for it. They just thought that it wasn't going to cultivate virtue. And furthermore, Platonists himself, like Iamblichus, were quite comfortable with a, for lack of a better term, ritual sacramentalism. So just because Victorinus values water baptism, notice how vague that is. What does that mean, valued it? Cho doesn't tell us. Again, this is more academic sleight of hand. Um, if you read the text and then you read Cho, you're wondering if you read the same book. Okay. So now this is the last section. So thank you very much for being Peyton. I know, uh, Sam, this has gone on much longer than, than I had said. So thank you very much for being patient. We're getting very close to the end. All right. Why is this important? What is going on here? Apart from the Platonism, think about Reformation doctrine. I said at the beginning that part of the problem is the Reformation doctrine views human nature and divine nature as self-enclosed. It's non-participationist, which is why my justice can't be God's justice and God's justice can't be my justice. They think of it like two horses pulling a load. If one doesn't pull, the other one has to make up the difference. Okay? So these things have to be contiguous. That's why justification has to be forensic. Now they say, well, we believe in the soul coming, the spirit coming into the soul and sanctification. That's true. They do. How is that to be understood in Reformed teaching? Oh, that's God creating effects in the soul. Right? That's a very attenuated sense of attenuation, of, uh, of participation, excuse me. So what you have is that these things, divine and human, are kind of self-enclosed. They can't participate. So they can only relate to each other extrinsically, not intrinsically or inherently. Now, why is this a problem? Because the root of this problem is not in soteriology. It's in Christology. So I want to say a few words about Christology, and we'll wrap this up. How does this show up in Christology? It shows up in the Reformed understanding of the Chalcedonian teaching of the Communicatio Idiomatum. What is that? You might think of idioms as qualities or properties, distinguishing characteristics. This is the idea that characteristics from each of Christ's two natures are had. These properties are possessed by the one divine person of Christ, okay? So there's actual communication to the divine person by both natures. All right, that's what the communicatio idiomatum is, as Chalcedon says, as in Constantinople uh, II, Constantinople III, all right? John of Damascus, this is how it's understood. For the reform don't understand it that way. They understand it in terms of synecdoche, that is, it's a manner of speaking. 
So there really isn't a transfer of properties from each of the natures to the one divine person. It's just that Christ can be said to have died or said to be immortal. It's an attribution. It's merely verbal or mental. It's how we think about it. It's not actually going on, right? There's no transfer of properties. Why is this a problem? Because it means that there can be no synergy in Christ between his human activity and his divine activity. And here we see the root of the reformed error. It's in Christology. The mistake in Christology structures their soteriology. And if you don't believe me, you can go read, I think Jill Rate is at Rate's book on the Marburg uh, Colloquy. And she has a whole section there on Christology. It structures all the sacramental debates between the Reformed and the Lutherans. The Lutherans have the opposite problem. All right. So if there can't be any cooperation, that means that God the Word does some acts and humanity does other acts. And now we're starting to look at a dual subject Christology. So I want you to take a look. There's just two more quotes, and then we'll finish up. I want you to take a look at this quote from, from Vermigli, who is a very important teacher of John Calvin. Notice what he says. This is in a dialogue on the two natures of Christ. He's arguing with a Lutheran. When you assert that the word suffered and died, the qualification is made that this does not happen from the nature of the Godhead, that is the divine essence, but from the nature of the humanity. I see your explanation of admitting two interpretations. The first sense is that you understand the Son of God to have suffered and died in the sense that the passion and death sprang from the human nature, so his body is affected, but nonetheless, so that they reached to the word itself and reached in a way that the word truly suffered and died. So a divine person suffers for a death. That sounds pretty awesome, right? That would explain why his death, I mean, if you believed it was meritorious, why it would be infinitely meritorious? Because this divine person actually suffers. Notice what Vermigli says. Some expressions of Cyril back at the Council of Ephesus, Ephesus conveyed this sense, which offended many people. Surely it should be beyond dispute that the word is impassable and immutable. Therefore, this is Verm Vermigli speaking, I will not agree with such a statement. Now look, the second sense, the second interpretation is that which we usually express when we say, synecdoche, that Christ suffered and died not from the nature of the Godhead, but from the nature of the humanity. Namely, that the passion and death proceed from the humanity and what? Were terminated in it since they did not pass through nor penetrate to the word itself. So God the word for Vermigli does not suffer for your sins. A man suffers. Because it could neither die nor suffer. But if the word is said to die and suffer, notice said. It's not properties, not reality, it's speech. That means that the nature which made it, made its own through the incarnation died and suffered. So the human nature died and suffered for your sins. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want you to look, this is the last quote, and I'll wrap up. Look at this text from your sinus, another ref major Reformation uh, figure. His commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism. He's dealing with an objection on the Christ, on Christology. Objection. But according to this, the word cannot be a person. Why can't the word be a person? Because he is a, a part of the person. Oh. So there's, the objection is, well, there's this general person, and then the word is another person inside this person. And that which is only a part cannot be a person. So that's the objection. Answer. That which is only a part of a person, and such a part that is not of itself a person is no person. So he grants part of the objection. Or that which is part of a person is not that person of which it is a part. And so it may be said of the word, if properly understood, that he is not the whole person of the mediator. He's not the whole person of the mediator. Who is the mediator? Christ. Although he is in and of himself a whole and complete person in respect to the Godhead. So there's the person of the mediator. And then there's Christ who's a subset. And then you have this humanity that's suffering in your place. Now, 
Um, if you want to see an extended discussion from a pro-Reformation point of view, the standard classic text is Richard Mueller's um, Christ in the Decree, Predestination in, in Christology from Calvin to Perkins. Now, I'm not saying all Reformation people believe this. I'm not saying all Reformed people believe this. It does show up in Calvin. It does show up in a whole bunch of other Reformed people. Some Reformed scholars aren't even aware of this, or they just paper over it. But this is the root of the problem. It's Christological. The divine and human cannot participate in each other. There's no possibility of partaking of the divine nature. And this is a problem, particularly for Mr. Rogers. Why? Because a lot of his arguments against, or at least some of his arguments against Arians and other Unitarians and things like this, depend on um, us participating in the divine glory, right? That they saw the glory of God, that the glory of God is communicated to the flesh of Christ. Well, Mr. Rogers' tradition won't let him believe that. That has to be a created effect because the divine essence is invisible. And the only thing that is God on the Reformed doctrine is the divine essence. There's no doctrine of the energies there, as we would talk about in Orthodox theology. So this is the end of the presentation. I know it's been extremely long. This is just the tip of the iceberg. But I want to communicate to Mr. Rogers. Look, dude, you look like a lot of fun. You look like you're a good guy. This is not personal. But... I just can't see how you're getting sola fide out of Maris Victorinus. I can't see how you're getting it out of any of those texts. It just, it just isn't there. There are no conceptual markers that are being expressed there other than just the term occasionally and a parallel um, structure to Pauline thinking at certain points. But it's clearly platonic. It's not um, scriptural. So. That ends the presentation. Um, is Sam still here? Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I'm such a, a we, no, no, we started December, what was it, uh, the 11th? Now it's December 25th. So Merry Christmas, brother. <laughs> no, it's a good, sorry good. That. No, no, it's all right. It's, uh, I think just the length itself is going to make Anthony repent. After seeing it's five hours, he's going to say, I give up. You're right. But uh, you're so I can remove this. Okay. So we got it. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's been five hours. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask a few questions and maybe have you come back and sure. do a Q&A because this was super, super in-depth spiritual meat. It's going to take me like several times to listen to it, to understand, because there's a lot of concepts <clears throat> that I need to learn because I'm not philosophically astute. But for the sake of my benefit, and I'm sure others will benefit, there's just a few terms maybe you can just define for us. For example, you said, and I've heard also Catholics use this, condign versus congruent merit. Right. What is condign merit? What's congruent merit, if you can just define those terms so that someone like me can learn? Uh, very simply, operative and cooperative. Condign is only God is operating. Congruous is God and some other agent are cooperating together. Okay. So it's so just condign. God is acting, you're cooperating with God. It's very simple. So in condign, it's God. So that would be, would you say then condign would be what reformers would call monergism god is the one alone that's acting um well it, it gets a little more complicated there because thomas will also talk about condign but thomas mm -hmm. aren't necessarily going to be modern monergists in the reformation sense there is a lot of overlap there um but it that so there's overlap there but there's different issues about god's causality and how that may work with human causality which are going to differ between, say, Thomas or Molinists on the one hand and Calvinists or Lutherans on the other. I see. Yeah, I'm more familiar because my, I came out of re, reform understanding. Okay, so you also said <clears throat> strict merit. Help us understand what is strict merit. You did a good job, but still I think sure. for my own benefit, I want to play it in my mind. Strict merit. Yeah, so this idea of strict merit is that there's inequality between what you give and what you get. So if you give $5, you only get $5 worth of stuff. You don't get $50 worth of stuff. Okay. So 
that seems to be what Victorinus is excluding. Uh, and a number of other authors in the Christian tradition are excluding. Augustine ex explicitly excludes it. So, you know, you doing things that please God, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, your rewards for that or your increase in justice for that that God may give you, as Ambrose talks about, um, isn't isn't like proportionate. It's not like your action could really pick up um you know you know is equivalent to whatever god gives you right mm -hmm. so none of your works that that's why that's why there's no room for boasting this is why all the stuff about boasting with mr rogers i was kind of funny because i don't know any catholics or orthodox who were like oh yeah i just i pulled off that virtue really awesome mm -hmm. uh, god's gonna give me this mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. right we just don't talk that way. It's just not there. It's not in the tradition. It's not in our liturgies. You know this in the Assyrian church. You don't hear this in the Assyrian church. You don't hear it in the Coptic church. There's no, you go to the church of India. <laughs> they don't talk about it that way. So that's what strict merit is. Um, it's a proportionate, you know, you get this much, you get that much, you give that much sort of thing. That's right. And then you mentioned finally, uh, created righteousness. So what is, created righteousness so you've said it you've you actually when i asked this i don't want to give the impression you weren't clear you were very clear but still we're creatures repetition sure you hear something repetitively by the grace of god until it becomes second nature so created righteousness what do you mean created righteousness well the reformed idea is that christ comes and in his human obedience he uh merits god's favor and that is not the righteousness whereby God is righteous in and of himself. So it's not God's holiness in and of himself. It's a holiness that comes about because of what Jesus does on earth. So it's created. Okay. And this is part of my problem with the Reformation teaching is like, why would I settle for created righteousness if I could have God's actual righteousness? Hmm. Like, and then think about this. How could Christ's created righteousness atone for my sins now i know what the reformed will say they will say well christ is a infinite person and that's why those acts are valuable but calvin says that those acts are only infinitely valuable before god because god willed them to be that way hmm. they're not valuable infinitely in and of themselves and then you look at like john owen in his book on the holy spirit he says that the only act that Christ exercised divine power with respect to his humanity was assuming it. That's why um, the, they believe the spirit comes to Christ and does all the miracles because Christ can't use his divine power to do that because then it would be divine righteousness, it wouldn't be human righteousness. Mm. And so um, the, the problem with that is then um, – no, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But uh, Owen, Owen presents a significant problem. It's lined up with the other Christological worries um, that I expressed. Oh, this is what I want to say. So that model of the incarnation where the spirit comes to the humanity of Christ from the outside to help him do miracles, that's the same model they have about scripture. The word is made effective by the spirit. Now, that starts to look very adoptionistic. Right. And again, this is the stuff that's in reform, higher level reformed writing. This is not stuff I made up. You can go read Mueller and other people. They're dealing with these issues. These are historical issues in reformed theology. I didn't, I'm just talking about them, but they're in refor reformed scholar sources. Now, here, here's the question since the reformers are saying Jesus could not, by his divine power, do miracles because then it wouldn't be a human being who's then earning meriting a righteous standing on behalf of those he represents so that's what they say now in the orthodox position when jesus did the miracles obviously and you knew with the spirit but the orthodox do not deny or they don't believe that it wasn't by virtue of his divinity as well right 
Yeah, so the idea is like in Maximus the Confessor, and I forgot to mention this, but the idea is generally this. Christ, human and divine will, they cooperate in synergy to produce a, a kind of kind of united act. So remember when I said for the reform, the problem is divine and human, they can't, they can't interact with each other, they can't participate in each other. They're just mm -hmm. contiguous. For an orthodox point of view, there's a synergy in Christ between his human power of choosing and his divine power of choosing. So Christ does do miracles by the power of the Spirit. But as Cyril says on in his um, when he talks about the baptism of Christ, he doesn't receive the Spirit in the baptism because he lacks power. He receives the Spirit in baptism to reseat the Spirit in human nature, so that the Spirit now has this permanent seat in human nature that was temporarily lost in Adam. So. So that kind of synergy, that righteousness that Christ does, it's human, but it's also divine. It's both. Okay. And that's part of the problem with the Reformation teaching. They separate, they either completely separate those like the Reformed, or they collapse them like the Lutherans. Mm. Okay. There are a lot of meat that we need to go over. I need to go over this. There's so much to learn, especially when it comes to the philosophical aspects of our beliefs because for most part i've spent most of the time studying scriptural refutation and exegesis to let's say anti-trinitarian cults but we have a whole world out there of uh, scholarship that's steeped in in-depth intellectual philosophical <clears throat> concepts language and argumentation and Sadly, I'm a little late to the game. I'm 49. But one thing I, I just saw. Hey, I'm 50. I'm no spring chicken, Sam. So Yeah, but glory to God, you've been doing this. I mean, you've been Orthodox for 21 years, and the Orthodox Church is very rich, very rich. People do, probably do not understand how rich, how deep it is philosophically, theologically, spiritually, and mystically. Uh, because remember, in the West, it's usually Protestant pitted against Catholics, uh, but here you have this beautiful tradition that's steeped so rich in <clears throat> theology, philosophy, spirituality, and <clears throat> mystical understanding the Christian faith. But I, I do see where you got this profound insight in the faith, and Orthodox Jihad highlighted it. I can see it started all from reading Dr. Zeus, because it's right there. Behind you. <laughs> Those are my best theological books. Man, right. dude, Dr. Zeus has helped you. I wish yeah. I had studied Dr. Person's Zeus. More than wow, you are the man. Now, brother, it, it, because it's already been five hours, we'll probably yeah. have you come and do a Q&A. Okay. Is there any final comments you want to make before we just uh, wrap it up? Yeah, I would say for people who are Reformed, who, who saw this, I know it's a lot. Um, I would say this. I, for example, like on the perpetual virginity of Mary, I didn't even get to any of that stuff. Mr. Rogers is right that that has a different place in Protestant thinking than it does for Orthodox or Catholics. And the reason is because we have a different Christology than they do. And so when people ask me, well, why don't you believe in justification by faith alone? I say, well, because I believe in the real Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. Because I can't believe in their doctrine of justification by faith alone with this created righteousness and how the two natures can't uh, cooperate or participate in each other. I can't believe in that and believe in the real Jesus. Mm. You know, it's like Walter Martin used to say, I grew up on Walter Martin. It's like, you know, he cites Paul, second Corinthians 11. I'm worried about you that you believed another Jesus, a different gospel, right? Yeah. So a lot of times reformed people think, well, we're, you know, we believe all the creeds and all this other stuff. It's just, we have this Calvinist stuff and, justification built on top it's really not it's really not the case it's mm. it's all, all the parts are interconnected yeah now i would say that that would be evident to someone who is really studying who's on a very high theological philosophical spiritual level but the average person they probably don't understand how profound the differences are and i and i say that across the board i think in all the major branches of of uh, Trinitarianism, there's not a lot of people who are on this level, or your level, or Orthodox Shahada. And so it's really very surface. So we don't see 
how this really connects with the Trinity, how the persons relate to one another, how the two natures of Christ relate to one another. It's all surface for us, right? So the well, more deeper we go. It takes time. It, yeah. it takes time. I mean, I, what you're seeing is 35 years. And and I didn't understand all this stuff. It took me a long, long time. I was a Calvinist. I mean, I, I went to yeah. Calvary Chapel. I, I You know, I, I, I did all that stuff. And, and, and there are a lot of things I don't know. There's tons of stuff. I mean, I see your stuff on Islam. I'm like, I mean, ask Orthodox Shahada. I'm just like, I know nothing about that stuff. Like, I've read the Korean and some Hadiths and stuff like that, but that's about it. I don't, I can't read Arabic. So, you know, it's like Paul says, there are different parts of the body. And so I would just encourage people, you know, don't be intimidated. You know, do what you can, learn and, and be patient. Take, take your time. Praise God. You know, God is... The one thing I love about the liturgy, and this was so comforting to me when I became Orthodox from Calvinist point of view, there's a point in the liturgy where it talks about God is a lover of mankind and he never stopped doing everything until he saved us and brought us to heaven. And, you know, I, that kind of universal love, I mean, in, in Orthodoxy for me, and it's not just in Orthodoxy, it's in other Christian traditions too. You know, God is merciful. Be patient. Take your time. You don't, don't don't rush things. Don't make a rush judgment, right? Because you'll end up making a really big mistake. So, yeah. And I'm hoping because I know Anthony. Like I said, I know him personally. I know he he loves the Lord Jesus Christ and he's zealous for the glory of Jesus and the truth of God. So I am hoping that once he listens to this, he will, for the glory of Jesus, because it's not about ego. May the Lord destroy our pride, our arrogance, our ego. That because he loves the Lord, he will apologize. And I would suggest that the best thing he can do is take down those videos because they're full of misinformation, not deliberate. Because obviously sure. he was relying on secondary sources. And it's not there's nothing wrong with quoting someone, but these well, sources people make are, mistakes. People yep. make some of the scholars make mistakes. They make yes. some of the mistakes he did. So I, I don't in no way do I want this to come across as malicious. I just think it should have been a little bit more cautious because when you watch yeah, his videos, it's like, oh, this is obvious. This is, you know, and I'm like looking at it like, no, it's yeah. not obvious. That's what I'm saying. Now that he went, because your, your meticulousness, there's no excuse for him now not to apologize and take the videos down and just say, look, I'm wrong and I apologize. May the Lord have mercy on me and I'll try to do better next time. But I sure. see that he's to show that apostolic church because he's got something scheduled on his channel. Now, I think what he wants to do is to show that just because this view that you articulated is found in the church fathers, forget the fact that one of them was clearly platonic. Put him aside. Let's we're talking about the others like Jerome. Didn't teach sola fide. The title of his next session is are the apostolic churches indefectible so i think mm -hmm. he wants to now say well just because maybe majority of christian theologians taught this that doesn't mean they're right but then that sure. would impugn that would impugn and blaspheme the lord jesus's faithfulness to preserve the church right. from falling into such damnable heresy so it's going to make it worse for him and i hope he's better than that so let's pray we'll see so, brother, it was an honor to have you here. Let me know if you want to come back and do another talk. I'll uh, try to make it shorter. I promise. No, no, back here, why don't you do this? Since uh, we started December 11th, we did December 25th. It's Christmas. Why don't you come back next week so that you'll finish by January 7th? Orthodox. Okay. Christmas. All right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm playing with you, brother. But it was an honor. Thank you, brother. I really was. I'm just playing with you. It was great. It was my pleasure. I need to rewatch this several more times before I can even understand it. So, but glory to God. That's how deep it was. And you are a blessing and the Lord preserve you and your family for his glory and use you mightily to impact lives. Thank and may you. the Lord Jesus bless the Orthodox Church and shine through it for his glory in Jesus' name. So thank you, brother. Amen.